Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience, the podcast that's more exciting and entertaining than modern wrestling. Of course, then, so is Crotch Rot. But nevertheless, to join me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, with the manscaping he's gotten, his crotch is never rotten, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. Yeah. Coffee in my hand and apparently a clean crotch. Mm. What more yeah. can a boy ask for? A pleasure to be here again. It won't last long. <laughs> it's already over. This thing's going to go down in flames and you're all going to have to take the trip with me. <laughs> Fucking geez, oh, Pete. This is going to be a, a Seinfeld podcast, an episode about nothing. It's a beleaguered day. I was, I've was i told you moments before we went on the air on the broadcast here, when we first began speaking to each other, that I was rubbing my eyes. And you said, oh, come on, the show wasn't that bad. I said, no, it's because of my general malaise. And, uh, for, talk about, again, I think I said this last week, from the penthouse to the outhouse. Things were cooking along. We had some things to look forward to, in wrestling at least and some exciting things on the horizon, and suddenly everything's collapsed, and all of our favorites are in an iron lung, as Strongbow would say, and here we are watching fucking Ozzy Oldham on AEW, and uh, the same six people that we didn't want to see last week in the WWE. And so we're going to give a lot of the program over today to the people, the cult of Cornette. I have got a number of emails of notes and letters and comments and follow-ups and things that people have written on things we've talked about and things that people need to know. We're going to talk about that some. We're going to shout out. I'll have you the wildlife update here at the castle. Not only is the baby deer just gorgeous, just the cutest little thing in the world, and the other morning, I can't remember what day it was. I've slept since then. I wake up and I look at it. It's, the birds are twinkling and the sun is just peeping up over the, uh, the, the, the horizon. And there is mama deer outside my bedroom window, nursing and grooming baby deer, licking him on the head and everything. And then he curls up in the mulch beds underneath the trees or in the hollow parts of a couple of the trees in the back where you can walk within 10 feet of him you can't even see him and then you suddenly oh shit there's the baby deer and then i do the peter griffin backup thing slowly and go the other direction but now we have another baby another blessed event here on the castle grounds i saw yesterday the cutest little baby bunny rabbit you've ever seen in your life it's the smallest baby i've seen hopping around on its own barely bigger than a chipmunk of which we have a plentiful supply this year also. The cute little chipmunks. I'm telling you, if I could just keep the goddamn human beings at, at a good distance away from the property, why, it would be Shangri-La around here. How many baby bunny rabbits do you have up there in Jersey? Too many. It sounds like Walt Disney would approve of whatever you got going on in the grounds over there. I'm sick of the animals uh, for a while. <laughs> sick of the you just moved to an even more I know suburban area where you'd have all the wildlife and the and the 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 nature and you're sick of it after what a month and a half? Suzanne's a member of some like Facebook group for all the neighbors. So I've seen now multiple videos of multiple bears running down the street, tearing <laughs> up garbage cans, sitting in driveways. And then the other day, someone said and it harkens back to my early days in the previous Last Matter. They said, watch out, our cameras captured coyotes by the <laughs> creek. <laughs> and I'm like, where's their fucking creek? I have no idea where the creek is. Now there's coyotes <laughs> back in play. When I see the deer now, I'm happy. Wait, wait a minute. Coyotes are in play. Coyotes are in play. So enough of the animals. You don't know where the creek is. There's no creek. Well, I know now. I got my drone out and I... Found the creek. It's over by well, her was, house, not my house. I was going to say, if you didn't have a pole saw and limb lopper, do you have a divining rod? A limb lopper? What's a... No, explain. Well, I remember we were talking about my combination pole saw and limb lopper last weekend when I got out there and cut some tree limbs, trimmed some trees, but do you have a divining rod? No, what is that? To find water. 
You have a yeah. rod to find water? Wait a minute. You have never heard of a divining rod to find water. I know what you're talking about. I didn't know it by that name, no. A tradition started back in the Old West. When, when, when the, there weren't a lot of Dodge Jews City, in the Old West. Well, when Dodge City was going through the drought, and you've seen it on every television program. I know Whatever, what it is. Dodge City yes. or Tombstone, they're going through the drought. We, we need water. The cattle are dying. Baby needs a new pair of shoes and something to drink. And then suddenly in, in town, in his little wagon, comes the water finder, the man with the divining rod. And he gets it and he performs his witchery. And this is a skill a you've mastered? Witcher, what they used to call it. You've water mastered witch- this? You could do this? I have a divining rod. Can I you do say, it? I, I might have to find a water witcher to use it. See, it's, it's a talent. Get you, but they they probably got uh, LED divining rods now, and ones that beep and things. You could, probably anybody can do it. I've got an old fashioned one. It's a forked stick. People have this image of you. They have no idea you're walking around your yard with a divining rod while bunny rabbits are hopping around <laughs> and deers are fucking, and it's just this wonderful, beautiful scene. They all think you're like in there punching away at your computer. It keeps me away from watching wrestling. I'll tell you. Oh, speaking of punching on it. Okay, let's start the show off with how the you're you're going to explain something to me today here on a program in front of all of the people, the cult of Cornette, because you started to the other day on the phone. And I said, wait a minute, save this for the show, because I already I'm getting fucking lost. But somehow. And I've narrowed one of them down to a reason not associated with our our friend Uncle Dave. But somehow I have trended on Twitter now over the past week either three or four times without ever actually being on Twitter myself. And actually, in most cases, I was out in the yard. A couple times I was signing action figures. And apparently, again, it has amounted to Uncle Dave's irrational fucking meltdown that he continues to have on Twitter trying to discredit my not only apparently valid but now increasingly popular opinions about some of his favorite wrestlers and he's causing me to trend even though I'm not seeing them or responding to them because so many people you're going to give the details on this but so many people were responding to him asking him what is goddamn rabbit ass issue was with me and what the fuck's the matter with you dave that i trended without knowing it and now it's to the point where he has somehow managed to fix it up to where people can't reply to him because so many people were taking the piss out of him and asking him why he didn't go to a movie or sit down and pet his dog how has he done all of this have i hired him to be my pr agent Well, let me just say, I don't know how many times you have trended exactly, because sometimes things happen at different hours and you're not watching, and I don't know how their trending things work, but it keeps popping up on my computer that you're trending at various points, and it all comes back to Dave's tweets. I do want to say, maybe I'm wrong, but it appears Dave may be going through something, so I feel bad in a sense... Maybe beating well, why up does on he him? have dragged me down? I don't him? know. I don't know. But he's tweeting like a West Coast bix. He flooded my fucking timeline the other day, which is nonsense after a while. So I don't know. I really don't know. See, I don't see it. I don't. I don't remember whether I blocked him or just don't follow him. And he he doesn't actually put my gimmick in there. He just mentions my name. Anyone who mentions you to him causes him to make sure to. Let everyone know that you are completely discredited, that there's nothing that you say that has any validity. No one should listen to you. You're the very (laughs) last person, anyone in AEW that Tony Khan should listen to, the very last person. Which makes me feel good, because I have a shot now. Uh, If you're the very last. (laughs) (laughs) It still could be worse for you, Brian. Yeah. But the other thing of note, and... Again, this is a topic that the listeners, unfortunately, have really taken to because they keep sending me all these emails about it. Dave is now, apparently he tweets out stuff and he's turned off the ability for anyone to reply, I believe, unless he follows them. 
But how I didn't even know you could do that. How did? But how is he's a grown man with a business to run? How does he have this much time on his hands to to do all of this internet witchery with the Twitter machine? I'm saying here here's another. I guess we should explain for some of the newer listeners. Because I still have sometimes if I will tweet something and I've been signing figures so fucking much the last several weeks, I've just, I retweet shit a couple times a day and that's mostly how, what I've gotten into. But people still say when I tweet something, they'll say, put your phone down. Like they don't know. So I will just bring everybody up speed again for all the longtime listeners. You're well aware of this. Don't have a smartphone, never going to have a smartphone, refuse to. I tweet on my computer where it's got a nice big screen and I got a keyboard in front of me so I don't type like a savage with my thumbs and I can check my spelling. And I do that first thing in the morning when I get up and I retweet our announcements of our shows and our clips and our various things. And then... Probably later on in the afternoon, I'll stop by again. But otherwise, I am not on the internet unless I'm talking to you and we're recording this show. So these things happen behind my back, but um, so I'm not really up to date on a real time. Like, how many of these people sit there in their daily life and look at Twitter constantly and like, are keeping an eye on it all day while they're awake. I don't understand because they answer instantly to anything at any time. There are people specifically in and around wrestling who live on Twitter. Live on Twitter. Go look at the amount of tweets. It'll blow your mind. Okay, so, so Dave has figured out a way that you can't respond to him unless he, you follow him or he follows you or how did that work? Hold on, I'll actually... Uh, because I, uh, I believe it was that he had to follow you or mention you in order for you to be able to respond, which I'm thinking maybe a way someone said, hey, you gotta stop fighting with everyone. And maybe the easiest solution was, okay, yeah, I won't let them reply, so I won't see it, but then he's still finding things to fight with. <laughs> but then people are, they're caused, because then they're screenshotting it and fucking sending out what's the matter with you, pal, and it's causing me to trend. And, oh, here's what I was going to say. Apparently, it's flummoxing my Twitter machine on my computer because normally when I get up in the morning, as I mentioned, I'll turn it on and I'll go down to where I last left off the previous day fairly quickly, scrolling down, see if anything catches my eye. But when it when this happens... It goes, the notifications go from like four hours ago to 17 hours ago instantly. I'm missing a big chunk of shit. It's like it's blown my thing up. It can't handle all the traffic. And so I don't get to see a lot of that of what the fuck went on unless I was to sit there and fucking try to figure out how to find it and I don't have time. So some of this I'm in the dark on, but I appreciate. We should use, you know, we should use it as a tagline. It's actually pretty good. Jim Cornette, the very last person you should listen to. Yes. <laughs> that'll that'll send our ratings through the roof. Everybody wants to taste <laughs> forbidden fruit. They want to do the the verboten. Uh they want to take a walk on the wild side with Corny. I, you know, I appreciate him being my um PR agent, but I'm doing okay on my own because one of the ones the times that I trended. Brian, I found out what that was for. It didn't have anything to do with, with Uncle Dave. I trended on Twitter, ladies and gentlemen, because on, I think it was your show, on one of the drive, on one of the recent podcasts over the last week or nine days, I said, one of the, I said, I really, I'm not a fan of Liv Morgan. She's not in the top echelon of the girls, in my, in my opinion, the Rias and the Charlottes of the world. She's too girly. She's a little small and girly. I trended on Twitter. People t specifically pointed this to me uh, because I upset all of the, what are the mouth breathers that, you know, follow the girls way too closely. And so therefore I am so irrelevant that if I say Liv Morgan's too girly for me, that trends on Twitter. What else should I, should I trend 
pistachio ice cream. I'm for it. Oh, shit. I'm blowing up the internet now, Brian. Are you really for it? No. Good. I just want to be controversial. Anyway, uh, speaking of controversial, we have passed that magic milestone over 300,000 subscribers on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Just want to thank everybody for their support. We finally, I still didn't get a cake from you again, Brian. I thought we established that the cake is not supposed to come from me. It's supposed to come from people who are celebrating with you or YouTube. Well, they didn't send me one either. The only one I can count on is Joni out there in Washington. She's a cake kind of girl. So (laughs) anyway, um, we talked about the Twitter business. We also, by the way, I will have you know I'm excited to say that what is today? Well, we... By the time the people hear this, it'll be somewhere later on in the day on Sunday, June 11th, right? Yes. No. 12th. What is the Sunday? 12th. Well, by God, by lucky 13, all of the orders from the many folks that have purchased items at Cornette's Collectibles at JimCornette.com will be signed and packed and in the hands of the Feather Bottoms. For delivery, anything, all the figures, we are caught up, up to date through Saturday morning, the whatever the day is before the Sunday I just talked about, the 11th. Everything through there by Monday will be in the hands of the Feather Bottoms, and it will be in the mail, obviously, by the end of the week, as soon as they slap that postage on it. And uh, I thank everybody for their patience while this took me so long, but everything, of course, I service all of the cult members by hand. So if you want... I wouldn't put it that way. Yes, no, that's exactly what I do. I service every single cult member that wants to be serviced by hand. So if you would like a hand job from Jim Cornette, (laughs) now there's no waiting. So go to jimcornette.com to purchase it. We still have a couple hundred of the commentator play sets available, as well as the graphic novels, the autograph pictures, and so much more. And I promise you that every hand job you get from me will be the best one you've ever had, and you will leave with a smile on your face at the pleasant experience that you've had shopping at jimcornette.com. And also, and by the way, as we mentioned, the I'm a Sin Guy shirts, we're going to be closing those up in the next couple of weeks, but they are still on sale. Obviously, all proceeds are going to NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org or you can contribute directly, Uh, but not only 100% of the proceeds, but also I'm matching what we raise on the shirt sales. We did, and thanks to Brian Last's very atypical uh, charitable contribution. It's not true. Aloha, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, we raised uh, around $5,000 in the month of May. Here we are 10 days into June, and I don't have an exact total, but we're a couple of grand in, and we're probably going to get to Nine or ten by the time that we wrap this up. So if you're if you've been on the fence, fall off the fucking fence and get your sin shirt while they're still available, jimcornet.com. Did I mention no waiting for these incredible you're gonna have a happy ending with all the merchandise that you get from me that I'm gonna process myself and then the feather bottoms are gonna fuck. The feather bottoms ultra careful handling system, fuck. So after I've Give it my five knuckle shuffle. They're going to fuck it and send it on its way to you. All right. Were you up late watching videos last night? What is this? (laughs) I was trying to watch these goddamn (laughs) wrestling programs. Let's get this. This is something that put me in a good mood. At least night before last, I was up late. Not that wasn't on Wednesday night. That was on Thursday night. The January 6th commission. The first, I have a series recording set up because they're going to do some of these in the daytime, some of them at nighttime and primetime. I don't want to miss a second because most rational people that follow any news outlet in America has already known a lot of this and suspectified much more of it, but it's great to hear the actual weasels that were involved trying to now save their necks now that they're 
under oath and under the penalty of perjury and on camera and being investigated by the government. They're spilling their guts. They don't want to lie for that piece of shit, that criminal, psychopathic, lying, repugnant piece of garbage. And he's going to turn on all of them. He's going to turn on Ivanka. He already He's already started, but... That's going to be the best, the family feud. That's well, going to be the off, best TV ever. Well, we got to mention for the, again, for the international listeners, the January 6th commission investigating the insurrection on the, the Capitol, January 6th of 2021, where Trump basically now, and we've uh, always suspected this, we've known this, but now they've actually got people saying it and they've got proof and they've got video and they've got timelines. He set this thing up, and he led it, and he orchestrated it, and he fucking foisted it off because he couldn't admit that he was a fucking loser, even though he already knew. And you know who don't want to know? Every news outlet in the United States of America carried these hearings in prime time on Thursday night from 8 to 10. The CBS network, NBC, ABC... CNN, MSNBC, every news network and outlet except Fox. They put it on Fox Business Channel, which is like when SmackDown got moved to Fox Sports 1 uh, and, and their viewership was cut into a third. They did This would be, be even worse because this didn't have a dedicated audience to begin with. They didn't want anybody to see their own fucking people having to tell the truth on audio and video because they were being examined under oath. Bill Barr, the hand-picked, droopy, Tom Bosley-looking motherfucker that pig shit himself appointed to be the attorney general, had to tell Donald Trump to his face, there is no fraud. You lost. These claims you have are, quote, bullshit. And it was great to hear Ivanka. And with that this deer caught in the headlights fucking look on her face when she's got that camera in her face and she's under oath and they're asking her questions, well, what did you think? Well, I, 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 I accepted Attorney General Barr's uh, uh, statement. I, I, I respect him. She knew that instantly her father was going to fucking excommunicate her from Christmas dinner because she had to tell the fucking truth, which the Trump family has been allergic to for so long. And you've got everyone testify. They've got the, the tape of everyone saying that they tried to get this piece of shit to do anything to stop the riot, but he wouldn't, and Pence had to take over and violate the chain of command. Pence is the one that called the National Guard. Pence is the one that called the Department of Justice. Pence is the one that called everybody involved because Trump was sitting watching TV, rewinding the parts he was giggling over because this was his plan, him and Giuliani and the rest of the criminals that he hung out with. They had arranged this to stop the certification, to delay it if it didn't happen that day then it was going to be sent back to the states where he already had crooked people trying to do his work and re-elect the state electors. One of those people already has come out. It, he asked Trump for a pardon because he knew what he had tried to do was illegal. And Trump knew he had lost. He knew from Pence. He knew from Barr. He knew from his own polling people. He knew from everybody that he'd lost, he got his ass kicked, but the man baby couldn't admit it. And he had a plot to stay in office. So what if people get killed? So what if goddamn democracy is overturned? Nothing's as important as Donald fucking Trump. And they have everything. And everybody's telling it. So what do you think the goddamn Trump suckers fucking excuses are going to be now, Brian? What do you think? What, what do you think they're going to say for themselves now? I think they're going to say it's old news. Oh, it's old news. Well, you can't deny what's there. 
reason. They didn't arrest Manson for a year and a half. So it's about the same amount of time. They can't accept that all the people that were telling them the reason why Trump derangement syndrome became a phrase and a thing and even has an abbreviation, TDS, is because a vast segment of the population in the United States and around the world were so offended by the thought that this obvious criminal piece of shit should be encouraged or enabled or elected to do anything involving anybody else was so far beyond the pale that their their minds were blown. And as a result, <laughs> we tried to tell people over and over, look, look what he is, look what he's doing, look what he's done, look what he says. You want to be involved with this? Fuck you. It's the same thing as Al Capone in Chicago. Yeah, a lot of the people in the neighborhood liked him because he fucking gave out free turkeys at Thanksgiving, but there was also the thing where he was murdering people. But as long as they got the free turkeys and the numbers racket paid off every once in a while, they were fine with a criminal psychopath running the fucking show. Well, the vast majority, I thought, of Americans wouldn't be. Now we find out it's a slim majority. But for you minorities out there, what do you think of your boy now? How can you support this? How can you defend this? It, it, if nothing else, are you not embarrassed and ashamed now that his own people are telling you while they are under oath he's a liar and a criminal? So maybe is this the moment of clarity? Or is it okay because you get a turkey on Thanksgiving and the numbers racket pays off once in a while, you want the fucking lunatic back in charge? I don't care if this even leads to a, a prosecution or a conviction anymore as long as everybody sees this and everybody sees his own people. And that's why the ones that have refused to show up and the ones that are fighting the subpoenas and the ones that are going to be found in contempt even more so than they already have, they're the ones that don't want to come out in public and tell the truth about what they know about this piece of shit because then they figure they're fucked either way because he'll fucking bury them and they'll all lose their jobs, their spots or whatever, or they'll implicate themselves too which is why some of them were already asking for pardons before he left office because they knew that they were doing that's another thing the vice president tells him i can't do this shit it's not legal it's not a thing that can be done but because his goddamn fox news cohorts and fucking conspiracy theorist lunatics that he hung out with that he listened to more than the experts in the United States government while he was president, which is why he was such a blithering simpleton. He didn't want to learn anything. He wanted to hear what he wanted to hear. They're telling him that they can do shit that they can't do. And when people won't do it, that are actually real government officials that know how this shit works, he either fires them or buries them or fucking tries to get somebody else to do it for them. Because he's a crook, and that's the way he deals with all these other business people that he's dealt with for 40 fucking years. But this was the federal government, and some people had a few principles, and other people knew that they weren't making enough money for the goddamn legal exposure. When he was doing criminal deals with his business partners, there was millions and millions of dollars on the line. These people make a couple hundred grand a year as public servants. They're not going to prison for 20 years for that pig-faced piece of shit. So I want all the people who, the, oh, Cornette's got this Trump derangement, just watch these fucking hearings and listen to what these assholes that were covering up for him have to say when they're under oath and they don't want to go to fucking prison and he can't pardon them anymore.
What'd you think of the whole thing, Brian? I thought Liz Cheney was fucking impressive as hell. There you go. There were things we never saw or heard before that were revealed, and it certainly makes you think that there's going to be a whole lot more rolled out. And the way it seemed to me, Pence is going to be the big part of this. Whether or not he cooperates, his people are going to cooperate, and they're going to reveal what was going on there. And that's where it gets interesting. You said about him feuding now with Ivanka, or whatever it was, him going on social media to slam his daughter, whatever you want to call that. Even Vince didn't do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, she didn't know what was going on. She'd already checked out by then. (laughs) But I think the fact that people will just stick with Trump, but all these other people who were always sticking with him are all saying these things. At a certain point, you just have to say, you know what? Even those other guys who were on the team with us for a while, maybe they're all right. And he's the problem. I have a feeling it'll, it'll, it'll come out to anybody with eyes and ears. So... Maybe 80% of the Trump suckers will still be sucking Trump, but maybe 20% of them might smarten up and realize what they fucking got for their fucking efforts. Here's the question. You know, and we don't know. We're not Republicans. But if Trump... You better never call me a... But if Trump ran against Pence in a primary state to state, do you think it would automatically be Trump? Or do you think Pence actually would have a shot? Because... For all those people that say they really are conservative and conservative values and go to church, he's the representative for them, not Trump. What do you think would happen? Well, here's the thing. Also, Pence has the personality of cabbage. And I believe he's honest, but obviously because he didn't commit criminal acts for the criminal he was working for. But remember, he's also a religious fucking fanatic and the worst kind of goddamn right-wing, old-fashioned conservatives. So, I mean, church would be mandatory. We'd have church prisoner of war camps. If I'm you not, don't go to fucking church, I'm you've not got saying, to be remanded to it. I'm not saying he'd be president. I'm saying if he ran in a Republican primary against Trump. No, but that's what I'm saying. Here's the thing. He's a horrible person in his own right, but he's honest and he has the personality of cabbage. So, no, he wouldn't beat, he wouldn't come close to Trump because the, the people we're down to that would vote for Donald Trump again are the worst of the worst, the most racist or the most asshole or the most fanatical or the most conspiracy theorist or the most gun nut or the whatever, the the worst kind of people that voted for Trump are the the worst of the worst would vote for him again. They're irredeemable. They can't learn anything. So what we have to do is try to we hope that these hearings will take 20% of the people out of his goddamn base that maybe still can be reached with some kind of fact and logic. And then that nullifies, I hope, his ability to ever be elected again. But I don't see another Republican that the people, because the people that bought into him, bought into him because of his promo, because he lied to them and they believed it. And he told them a bunch of shit that was obvious bullshit, but that they wanted to hear because he could talk. Nobody else is going to do that. Nobody else can either talk like that or is going to be able to just blatantly lie and pull shit out. I mean, all the Republicans lie, but it's carefully planned no, lies. Yeah, he demolished Ted Cruz. He took Ted Cruz down one, two, yeah, three. No, they, they have carefully planned lies that sound like reasonable statements and deflect things. No, Trump just fucking pulls bullshit out of his ass that everybody wants to hear right at that moment and says it is fact. So no Republican can get the Republican, more Republican vote than Donald Trump. So we need to just nullify his ability to ever be elected again by getting 20% of his followers to somehow see the light, get treatment, come to a realization, what the fuck's going on, and that would, because I'm... (laughs) You would you would hope after we'd seen it and experienced it the first time that any Democratic challenger or any Republican challenger in a primary would beat 
the fucking absolute worst, most criminal president that's ever served in the United States of America. It's 17 fucking. When did Washington start? 89. But no, it, it, and they won't, a lot of them won't believe facts and video and statements that are presented in front of them. So we just got to reach the ones that are reachable and let the rest of the people, because that's what it's going to take to, to get any part of this country back together again. There have always been these people in the country, but Trump legitimized them. He normalized them. He made it seem okay to say these stupid things and to do these horrible things. And he made the worst of the assholes and the nutcases and the psychopaths seem like they mattered and they were credible and they he validated them. And they'd been, they suddenly, oh, I, we've been right all along because he was the first one that ever. And obviously, rightfully or wrongfully, he's the first person to ever consider them as actually a constituency that you would want to go after. He appealed to the stupidest, the most ignorant, the most hateful, the most, let's face it, you know, challenged mentally with fucking conspiracy theories and lunatic fucking ideas. And the religious nuts, even though he's got, anytime Donald Trump set foot in a fucking church, it should have immediately burst into spontaneous combustion. But he was able to appeal because he just lied to them and they wanted to hear it. So he got all the fanatical people. He made their opinions seem like that they were, had some validity to them. The simple, it, it was like we had eight years of intelligent people in charge. So now let's give the stupid people, because all the stupid people were upset they weren't being represented. How do we fix immigration? Let's build a wall, 5,000 mile long wall across the fucking southern border. That's how you fix immigration. The simpleton philosophy, people with very limited brain power that say stupid things that they blurt out of their ass, that's the constituency that he went for. And nobody had ever done that before. And the only way that we're ever going to fix this is to nullify his group so it's not big enough to get anybody elected ever again. Or we will continue with this shit. We need to go back to adults being in charge Experienced professionals, those are generally found on the Democratic side of the fence. And let these people crawl back in their fucking hole. Anyway. Hey, you said you're DVRing it. What is the schedule? You said I didn't realize it was day and night. What does the schedule look like? Well, I think it starts again on Monday during the day. I think it is. And then is it next Tuesday or Wednesday night? See, what I, I hit the DVR and it, it, it will say January 6th commission hearings new. And I'm recording MSNBC because those are my favorite news anchors. I like Nicole Wallace's analysis. She's the best one on that network. She was, she's reformed. She used to be a Republican. She reformed. worked for George Bush. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry to be reformed. I'm sorry. She she went to rehab. She's been rehabilitated. Reformed would sound like she's a criminal. She was under the influence of, you know, some foreign substance to engage in that line of thinking. I have emails. Would you like to hear some emails? Let's hear some emails. Well, first, I've got a, a note that I jotted down from the local news. I heard this was on Louisville television. But it's from Lawrenceburg, Indiana, and there were pictures to accompany this. A fisherman up at the lake in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, caught a 20-pound catfish and thought, boy, howdy. But then he realized, look at this catfish. Its belly is so big. Maybe it's about to have babies. That must be eggs, whatever, right? Well, when he pushes on it, that's the hardest catfish belly, pregnant catfish belly he's ever mushed on. 
So they do what you do with fish when you've caught the fish before you eat the fish. They cut the fish open to clean it. And guess what they found inside that 20-pound catfish that they caught at the lake in Lawrenceburg, Indiana? I have no idea. A 10-inch long dildo. And there were pictures. They had Well, they had a picture of the, the catfish with the giant belly, and then they had the picture of this guy sitting in his boat holding this thing up in between his hands, and they did the digitization blur of the aforementioned dildo, which they referred to as an adult toy. You weren't lying. Have you ever seen... Episode about nothing. You weren't lying. <laughs> Have you ever seen a catfish that could swallow a 10-inch dildo? And if you do, can you get me her phone number? Horrible. All righty. Um... <laughs> Let me, here's it now, straighten up now and fly right, as Mama Cornette used to say. Straighten up and fly right. This is from Alex, and he's had bad health. Hello, Mr. Cornette and Mr. Last, a very respectful and polite and responsible young man. He says, I'm Alex. I'm 16 years old from Minnesota. I just had an emergency surgical operation about five days ago. Now, this was, the email came in about 10 days ago. So a couple weeks ago, Alex. He had his entire shunt replaced, and I, he had to go on because I didn't know, but it helps with his medical condition called hydrocephalus. The shunt moves the fluid from my brain through my body. Otherwise, it would be stuck in my head. Obviously, apparently, that's what? not a place you want it to be. Yeah. The shunt? I, uh, You know, I've heard that used as a word, like I've shunted him away or whatever. Maybe that's... We need it. Well, we're going to get in some it, entomology here in a minute. And I guess that's the study <laughs> of entomans baked goods. It's entomology. Well, anyway, the shunt has a tube which got clogged with the fluid. Well, that sounds like rain in Spain, mainly on the plane. The shunt has a tube which got clogged with the fluid, hence the surgery. That's what happened. But Alex goes on. I would like to thank you, gentlemen, for the programs that have gotten me through this and will continue to do so with all the laughs, jokes, and rants. Not only the surgery, but also with my depression that I deal with, the shows always cheer me up. Alex, don't hold today's show against us. We'll try to keep our average up, but sometimes the cake doesn't always rise. But anyway, uh, we just wanted to say good luck to Alex. I hope you're feeling better. 16 years old, and you're already, well, at least, you know, a lot of 16-year-olds, you can't prove they've got a brain. We know Alex has a brain because they're working on it. So. Good luck to Alex, and we hope he feels better. And as a matter of fact, while we're on the same topic, from Joel in San Marcos, Texas, uh, and this was from just about a week ago, so we may be ahead of this. Uh, hey, Jim and Brian, he's a little more familiar. Are you a friend of Joel's, Brian? Know him personally? I don't know Joel, no. Well, he's very familiar with you. Hey, Jim and Brian. Hey, Joel. I don't recall being on a first-name basis with him anyway, but nevertheless. My Uncle John is having heart surgery in the next couple of weeks, which canceled our beach trip for the summer. So that's apparently what he, how much he thinks about his Uncle John. Oh, John's having his heart taken out of his chest. Fuck. Guess we don't get to go to the beach. But anyway, Uncle John, apparently, Joel continues, he's a big fan of Jim's old school work with the Midnight Express and the Heavenly Bodies. When he heard he was having heart surgery, he went into a little bit of depression. No wonder with a Fucking nephew like you worried about going to the beach, working on your tan. But, Joel continues, I was trying to find something that would cheer him up. Okay, maybe Joel's redeeming himself now. I was hoping if Jim could give him some sort of shout out and encouragement since he's a big fan of the show and of Jim overall. Well, Uncle John, I'd like to say from Brian and myself, get well soon. You're going to come through this with flying colors. And if I were you, I'd keep Joel as far away from me as possible during your convalescence and recuperation. He sounds like he would want to go to the beach more than he would want to see you regain your health. Possibly he's going to rush you into this thing, try to bring you straight out of the ICU, put you in the station wagon and take you down to the fucking beach, down there to Corpus Christi, wherever you're going. I'd keep Joel, put Joel's picture up in the hospital at the switchboard there and said, do not allow this man to come in. But Uncle John's going to be fine. Would you like to wish well to Uncle John, Brian? Good luck, Uncle John. You have the perfect name for 
A molester in a van. I really don't know. <laughs> what the? <laughs> now you, well, now you, you just take it to dark. Come play with Uncle John, life. kids. <laughs> Go get in the car with Uncle John. <laughs> no, but seriously, get well soon. <laughs> get well soon, Uncle John. Just don't try to take any kids home from school. Um, Speaking of John, here's John Harding. From Pittsburgh. Well, I've just given him his whole name out. Now he'll be harassed constantly. But while we're on the condolences, uh, this one, good morning, Jim and Brian. I wanted to thank you both for the hours of entertainment during this rough patch of my life. Last Wednesday, I came home from work and found my puppy had passed away at the age of 16. We adopted her from the Animal Rescue League in Pittsburgh. She was the best dog I could ask for, and her name was Midnight. And he actually attached some pictures and and what a cute puppy but he john says thank you for your hours of entertainment youtube been the only bright spot in my day since she's passed away and that but she was 16 and she got rescued you guys rescued her so she lived a better life than she would have and you know that harley will be eight this summer and she's got the bad back leg now her patella is turned sideways that happens to uh pomeranians apparently but we're giving her anti-inflammatories and everything but that would if she if she does knock on wood make it another eight years that would be fantastic so midnight had a had a great life you should have brought him brought him down to one of the midnight reunions when he was younger he could have managed us like uh scott steiner's dog arnold did that time are there any points in your career where things maybe went sideways that you think maybe they could have gone differently if you did have a puppy at home to come home to? What? Does it change you having Harley there? If you had Harley at home during Smoky Mountain, would anything have been different? Yeah, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> you kidding? <laughs> you a fucking little gorgeous little loving puppy dog like Harley at home during the Smoky Mountain days. I wouldn't want to leave the house and fucking take bumps and cut my head and fucking stress myself booking and fight with fans and yell at wrestlers. And I just stayed home and rubbed the puppy's belly. Interesting. So puppies are more effective than families at keeping wrestlers home with their family. Yeah. <laughs> For heaven's sake, you, you never need a break from a puppy. For heaven's sake. Well, sometimes um, I got to close the door in here. All right, now. Oh, I want to thank also Greg. Greg Fort from Des Moines. Heard the program a couple weeks ago where I was bitched. I went out of town to an undisclosed location and realized that I didn't have a watch anymore because my watch band broke a couple of years ago, but I don't go anywhere anymore. Uh, so I haven't gone to Walmart to get my customary $13 watch. but. He heard that program and sent sent me a gift watch that both Stacy and I both would like because it's a watch that tells time with a regular minute hand and an hour hand and a second hand, not like his digital bullshit. But it's on a San Jose Sharks face, which is her favorite hockey team. So now, so there you go. So now I can tell time. And in, it, it didn't work out too good when Stace tried to play hockey with it. It dinged it up a little bit, but it tells good time for now. But thank you, Greg, in Des Moines, Iowa. Even though you're not into sports, do you have a team that you root for in each individual sport? Well, I I used to, obviously, root for, support, watch all the time, be a fan of the University of Louisville basketball team, the Cardinals, because we've been, we've been fighting this rivalry with those rich bastards over in Lexington, the University of Kentucky, for 60 years now. And finally, back in the 80s, the Doctors of Dunk and some of the other great teams we had, the great players, Daryl Griffith, and they finally got us some respect. And we had a French and Denny Crum, the coach, Hall of Famer. We had a franchise ball team here. We had national titles. And then even though we got a, a no good Yankee coach that at once, I, that was, that was a big deal. Also, he'd once actually coached for the university of Kentucky and then suddenly was in charge of Louisville and people, there were almost mobs forming about that. Uh, but 
after all that, the whole thing falls apart. Our fucking coach went out, blanked on the fucking coach's name. God damn it. He's gone now. Randy Atcher. No, shut up, you <laughs> asshole. Anyway, god damn it. That, that, that Italian slick haired prick from up north. Anyway. Calipari? No, he's the one. He coaches Kentucky now. No, the one we just. During all the scandals, my God, I've gone blank on it. Look it up. Who just. The two coaches ago in Louisville. Anyway. The NCAA took the titles away, sanctioned everybody. The coach was getting a blowjob in the bathroom at Carabas. They fucking fined the team for supposedly on recruiting trips. They were getting hookers to fucking entertain the prospective players, which I don't know if you're on the University of Louisville basketball team. Hiring a hooker is like taking a ham sandwich to a smorgasbord. It's, I don't know why you'd even go to that trouble. And just all the bullshit, and then the latest coach that we had, and then the COVID pandemic, and now they fired him. They brought an ex-player, Kenny Payne, back into town, try to rebuild this whole thing and the goodwill. He's bringing a bunch of former players from the 80s back in key spots. He's got Milt Wagner's grandson he's trying to recruit. Uh, you know, so they're... But, that went sideways several years ago, and I just I didn't even watch the last couple of years the Louisville Kentucky game every December. I just I was not amused anymore, and that's the only sports team per se in any sport that I particularly have rooted for with any degree of interest. So if I asked you if there was an NFL team that you just root for a little bit, there isn't like one. Uh, Cleveland's close enough. No, there's nothing like that. I mean, there's no, no I haven't. I don't know that I've watched a complete football game from start to finish in my life. I've watched parts of numerous of them. But my mom loved football. Mama Cornette loved to watch football. But I don't watch hockey, but I root for the Islanders. Why? Because they were great when I was a kid. I was from Long Island. They were the, the Long Island team. They were something okay, to once be very proud Cleveland. of. I ain't from Cleveland. I I'm use from, Cleveland as an example. I, well, I'm from here. If we still had a fucking pro basketball team, I'm sure I'd root for them. I was from Long Island, but I rooted for the New York Mets. Technically, they're a team in Queens that are supposed to be a representative of at least the five boroughs, let alone Long Island and New Jersey. It's the same thing. You live in the suburbs. Well, what, who am I going to root for? The Huntington, West Virginia titty fuckers? There's nothing around Louisville. How far out of Cincinnati are you? Since it's a hundred miles. Oh, okay. Right. Cincinnati Red. I don't like baseball. The Cardinals. I'd rather, no, I'm thinking. I'd rather, I'd rather watch a tick drain blood off a fucking cow than watch a baseball game. It's more exciting. What about the St. Louis Cardinals? What about them? They were for a long time the furthest west any major league baseball team went. They were the team that was beloved by so many people in the Midwest of whatever states got actually radio of the Cardinals. Yeah, fuck them. Okay. We got Cardinals here. Louisville has Cardinals. St. Louis stole our bird name. We're going to give them the bird. I've got a Cardinal right outside my window right now. Louisville is known for Cardinals. What did St. Louis ever, who did St. Louis ever beat? The St. Louis Cardinals? They're the well, winningest most team in the history of National League Baseball. Well, then they should change their name and maybe I'd pay attention to them. Anyway, here's something. Did you... Did you hear, and I, I wanted, while I was doing, you took me in another direction there. I knew exactly where I was going for the first time in this program. You took me in another direction. Dave Hebner, I've just heard his health is in bad shape. And um, we got an email that, uh, that uh, from somebody who knew the, the family that said that he wasn't doing well. And it, was there any old Dave Hebner stories that we had? And I guess... Everybody knows Earl Hebner now. There are younger fans and younger listeners that might not know that Earl and Dave Hebner were twin brothers. And both of them started out working for Jim Crockett because they're both from Virginia. But they started working for Jim Crockett in the 70s. And both of them refereed at, at various points. But Dave, I, get, I don't know what, early in the 80s, I think it was. Uh, 
Dave got a job with Vince McMahon in the WW. It might have been the WWF at that point. How long no. was he there? Do you have any idea? I don't think he got there that early. I want to say he got there 85, 86. Okay, I thought it might have been 82, 83. Well, it's still been the WWF. But anyway, so Dave Hebner is refereeing for Vince, and Earl Hebner is refereeing for Crockett. And we all, all the boys always got a kick out of it because, you know, you would turn on the other company's TV and you would look like you would see your own referee there for a second. And then you'd realize, oh, wait a minute. But the most famous deal that they ever did and the way that Earl, I think this was the way he gave his notice at Crockett Promotions, to be quite honest, was showed up on Saturday night's main event. He did Luger before Luger 10 years earlier. Back in those days, when there was no internet and you had to get your, you know, newsletter delivered in the mail once a week, the only way that news traveled in wrestling was when people telephoned each other or if it was a live TV show, which were in those days few and far between. But Saturday night's main event was obviously live on NBC. And I taped those shows because. You know, it's how we were always on the road, especially on a Saturday night, but those were the big events, an arena show. I would see what was going on. And what what was that leading up to? That was after the twin referee deal was when Hogan and Andre and DiBiase, the whole nine yards. That's right. Andre won the title due to the twin referees and then sold it immediately to Ted DiBiase. Yes. But the point is, I'm watching the show because I had no idea. I'm watching the show, and when they do the reveal of the twin referee, which was perfect, because later on in life, Dave gained more weight and got chunky, and you could tell him and Earl apart. But at that point in time, when they were that age, they were still almost identical. And they reveal the twin referees, and I popped, and I got this biggest grin on my face, because it wasn't going to hurt Crockett's business that one of his referees left, but I knew, oh, there's Earl. He's probably going to make more money he's ever made in his life. And especially when Hogan did the press and threw him over the top rope. Jeez, I was like, my God, he's going to kill him. But that was a huge pop from all of the boys working for Crockett because, like I said, it wasn't like one of our main event guys left and left us all in the lurch and fucked up the booking. Was it going to hurt the business? Everybody liked Earl and was happy to see him on the show. And plus, that was the greatest what was it? Was it Heenan that said, how much was the plastic surgery? Or who was that? I can't remember that. It may have been Vince. May have been Vince. Because it was Vince and Ventura on commentary. Oh, that, well, and maybe it was Ventura. Because I'm thinking the, the color commentator said, but nevertheless, that was a great fucking spot. And, you know, suddenly we were laughing also because here poor Earl went from refereeing and he was Tommy Young was a senior referee so Earl wasn't even the top referee but he went from refereeing you know and for Crockett and helping with the ring some to being on network TV and with higher ratings than any program that we'd done because it was on NBC so that was but uh, I always like both the Hebners Dave ended up transitioning not long after that in the WWF into an agent position instead of referee. And he worked in, and he was mostly the agent that would work the box offices at live events and TV tapings. As I mentioned before, when we talked about what the agents did, he'd be dealing with the box office, the, the radio stations, the advertising meet and greets, sponsors, things like that. While Jack Lanza or Tony Gurria or, you know, George Steele, somebody else was in the locker room dealing with the matches. So Dave was an agent and Earl continued refereeing all those years after that. Because I guess it would have been, it was such a shock and it was such a great visual when you had identical twin referees. But at the same time, if they'd have both continued to referee full time, especially on TV, it may have been confusing or distracting. What do you think? You know, it's funny that they made a big deal out of the idea that one of the referees or somebody, not even one of the referees, somebody was paid to get plastic surgery <laughs> to look like Dave Hebner. 
And then the end result was, okay, let's give him a job. Because it wasn't like he ever left TV. You'd still see his pull-aparts and different things that happened while the well, other yeah, one was refereeing. Then when they revealed his name, I bet those people thought, boy, he really went all the way with it. That former <laughs> Tits McGee from Puxatawney, Pennsylvania, suddenly changed his name to Earl Hebner because he looks like Dave. And what really sucks is now we know that DiBiase, the money he was using, was coming from the poor people of Mississippi. And it's just horrible. Well, there, and, and I'll tell you what, the people of Mississippi could have used some plastic surgery if anybody could. Oh, hey, that's not nice. I bet. Well, there's, there's some down there that you could have. Good Lord, I've seen some women there sit in front row. If you gave them a facelift, you'd have enough left over to make a midget. <laughs> oh, my God. This one woman had so many facelifts, she had nipples on her chin. <laughs> but I digress. Um, <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> because, you know, that's. That's the thing about, about your appearance, Brian, your appearance. It's all about your appearance, see? You got to keep looking good. You got to keep up appearances. <laughs> right. You know what you got to keep mostly, don't you? You got to keep your hair. Yes. Folks, I, I'll tell you something. You know, every morning when I wake up now, I look at the pillow, and my pillow looks like the sidewalk around a fucking burning building with people jumping out trying to escape it all of my hair is just leaving it looks like the stockbrokers coming out the windows in october of 29 it's just it's departing like billy martin i'm telling you but anyway if you want to keep your hair our friends at keeps have the answer because of course we've mentioned so many times in so many different ways that two out of three men are going to experience some kind of hair loss by the time they're 35 it's going to be the male pattern baldness going to be the Male pubic baldness, we've talked about that. Sometimes your wife or intimate partner may just get pissed at you and shave your head in the middle of the night. You never know what'll happen, but somebody, two out of three of you, are going to lose some fucking hair, whether by force or not, or nature, over the next uh, little while. And more than 50 million men in the United States suffer from that male pattern baldness. And you wouldn't believe some of the patterns. I mean, sometimes it's a checkerboard square kind of layout. Sometimes it's the pattern that looks like one of those Rorschach tests where your hair falls out in different spaces and it, the top of your head looks like a bat or a butterfly, depending <laughs> on your emotional state. It's amazing the patterns that this male baldness can manifest. I know one guy had a <laughs> fucking bullseye target pattern on his head when his hair fell out in a bullseye and people from... Floors up on high rises. We're trying to drop things. See if they could hit the bullseye. He had brain damage. So, folks, if you want to keep your hair and avoid brain damage, go to keeps.com. K E E P S. If you can't spell a five letter word, I don't know how to help you. Probably got bigger problems than your hair falling out. But keeps.com treatment started just $10 a month because they offer the generic versions of the only two FDA approved medications that prevent hair loss. They've got a network of expert medical advisors and prescribers and care specialists to support you in making your hair goals a reality and virtual consultations. You do not have to go in person. You don't have to talk to the doctor face to face. You don't have to go through that whole thing where he grabs your crotch and says, turn your head and cough. And then he grabs it again on the other side and says, turn your head the other way and cough. And he tells you to bend over and he sticks his finger up your ass. And while he has his finger up your ass, he's got both hands on your shoulders guiding you in a certain day. You don't have to go through all of that. You can do this on the, on the, the computer conveniently and virtually. And did we mention... <laughs> The, what what are you laughing at? I'm serious. You can do it right yes, on the you computer. Can. I'm not, serious, yes. Not the finger up the ass. That doesn't no. work over the computer. You can talk about it, but you can't actually do it. But uh, with this, you can do it right over the computer. They'll mail the stuff to your door. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, if you're seeing those, those miserable little lonely hairs on your pillow, hairs on my pillow. Then you go to keeps.com slash JCE to receive your first month of treatment for free. We give it to you for free around here. That's keeps.com slash JCE to get your first month of treatment for free. Do not lose your hair. Save those, those poor little bad boys. 
You might need them later on in life. Hairs on my pillow. I love that tune. You remember that, don't you? I remember the real version by Little Anthony and the Imperials. But let me ask you this. Think about how wrestling history would have changed. You ever see those photos like mid-50s of hard-boiled Haggerty before he was completely bald, before he started shaving yes. his head? Yeah. What if he went the other way and all of a sudden filled in his hair? Wouldn't have been hard-boiled. No, he wouldn't have been. He would have been fluffy Haggerty. <laughs> Do you, I, I've not only met hard-boiled Haggerty, but got his autograph on a Get 1950s wrestling program at the uh, Cauliflower Alley deal in, what was it, 2000? I think, or 2001, one or the other, in uh, Las Vegas, because me and some of the OVW guys went out to do a trade show that was, they were having a convention in Las Vegas, and it was two computer companies. And we had a babyface tag team and a heel tag team. The heel ta team represented the computer company's arch rivals or whatever. And I managed the heels, of course, and tore down the, the computer company that was hosting the event verbally. And they and then we went to Cauliflower Alley. So that was a fun thing. And you got to meet Hardboiled Haggerty. That's, hard -boiled the thing. that's, what's, that's why CAC is dead now. Because all the guys that you would actually want to meet, they're all dead. They're, not, they're either dead or they refuse to come to CAC anymore. And now it's all these guys we don't want to watch on TV every week and they'd be there in person. Yeah. Um, speaking of people we don't want to watch on TV every week, great segue there, Brian. Thank you. You were an unwitting co-conspirator in that. Do my best. We put out the APB amongst the statisticians in the cult of Cornette a couple of weeks ago because we were talking about Daniel Garcia a and nothing against this young man, but he came out of nowhere and we can't get rid of him. There's other people on AEW that we've been looking forward to see and never see. They're in federal witness protection. But suddenly, Daniel Garcia was on Wednesday night. He's on Friday night. He's all over the place. He's wrestling Punk. He's wrestling Moxley. He's, he's in the mix. Never heard of him before. Suddenly, boom. And I said, how many TVs has he been on? How much does he wrestle compared to anybody else in this company, right? So, Peter, I don't know whether he wants his last name uh, revealed or not, but he's from Milford Haven, Pembrokeshire, United Kingdom. So he sounds really snooty. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, Lord Fog. <laughs> oh, oh, jolly good raw told <laughs> Actually, you know, nobody really sounds like that. When I went over there, I was waiting to hear the jolly good old rot. And nobody sounds like that. They all go, cheers. We miss the, the good old, yeah, you miss the good old fashioned stuffy Brit. That guy's gone. Yeah, the stuffiest Brit I came in contact with was the guy in the elevator at one of the hotels was asking me if the fucking bar was open and I couldn't understand what he was saying because he had that, where were we then? Was it, it wasn't Nottingham. It was, uh, well, it's a certain type of accent over there. And, and he saw me carrying my ice bucket because that's the only place you can get ice is at the bar. There's no ice machine. If the bar is closed, you get no ice. And he sees me carrying the ice machine. He says, oh, I said, I, I, I said, I'm sorry? I said, I'm looking at him like he's got steaming turds hanging out of him, and I'm trying desperately to fucking figure this out because I don't, he's bigger <laughs> than me anyway. I'm thinking, what, are you allowed in... In England, if the guy in the elevator doesn't understand what you're fucking talking about, can you just begin wailing on him? I don't know the local customs. I said, one more time, brother, a little slower. And finally you go, oh, is the bar open? I was like, oh, I hope so. That's where I'm headed to. And then it come to find out it was. What were we talking about? Well, we were talking about this email from... <laughs> <laughs> from Peter, who's definitely a pumpkin eater, over there in Milford Haven, Pembrokeshire, United oh, right. Kingdom. <laughs> the Trent on Stoke on Whistle and Pig. That was one of the, the pubs over there, was the Whistle and Pig. I've whistled at a lot of pigs. The four-legged ones won't come for you. 
Hi, Jim and Brian. What was this topic? On this I don't even remember what the topic was of this. <laughs> well, I'm talking about this email. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about this email is what I'm talking about here. Where we asked a question of the cult, the statisticians, this Daniel Garcia. Keep up with me. Keep on. You, you're, you're, you're like, have you had your coffee? I've had two coffees. Yes. All right. I'm on vitamin water now. How big are they? The how, coffees? Bi- how big a boy were they? The coffees, the cups, the mugs. They were venti, the which in Starbucks language is as big as it gets. Uh, poor buddy Wayne. Bless him. Buddy Wayne asked me one time, the one from Tennessee, not the one from in the Northwest. Bless him, too. Well, bless him, too. But I was talking to Buddy Wayne. He said, Jim, he said, you know, I've been on a diet. I said, you have? He hadn't lost a single ounce. I mean, he's the only guy I've ever seen. His hair was fat. I love Buddy. He was fucking (laughs) hilarious. But he just, he was, his own, his his hair was he had a huge fluffy head of Jerry Clower. He looked like Jerry Clower, but bigger. He had, had a huge fluff of Jerry Clower fluffy hair. He didn't have a double chin, but he had a double face. He's only got a, his own son called him Head. And he told me, he said, I've been on a diet. I said, Oh, you have, buddy? He said, Yeah, all I've had to eat today is a salad. I said, What'd you have it in? A number two wash tub? <laughs> so it depends on the <laughs> size of the container. But anyway, so back to this email from Peter from Milford Haven, Pembrokeshire, oh, United Kingdom. Yeah, oh. God save the Queen. Hi, Jim and Brian. God save the Queen. On this week's JCE, Jim wondered how often Danny Garcia had been used on TV compared to others. As I'm on annual leave this week and have got nothing better to do, here we go. I've counted up all of the Dynamite and Rampage matches on of some of the main guys in AEW and then counted the days since the first match they wrestled on TV and then worked out the average days per TV match. Pay-per-view matches not included. We're just talking about television. We're not talking about YouTube or whatever. So you've got this down. Since they started, however many days ago they started, how many matches they've had, you divide it, You see one match every so-and-so days on television, right? Daniel Garcia has had 16 matches in 306 days. Nine on Dynamite, seven on Rampage. That means one match every 19.1 days. You would think it would be more often, right? As much as we've seen him. You would think. But Adam Page has been there 978 days and has had 57 matches, 56 on Dynamite and one on Rampage. Adam Page wrestled one time on Rampage. That's a match every 17.2 days. So he's got Daniel Garcia beat by two days. But now let Twinkle Toes McFinger bang, which is actually the way he wrote it here. Go ahead. I was just going to say, though, Adam Page is from the beginning of AEW, not from the moment Daniel Garcia got there. Right, right. That's his entire run. But since he's had 57 matches in 978 days, that means a match every 17.2 days. Garcia's had 16 matches in a third of the time, 306 days. So he's had a match every 19.1 days. See how we're doing this now? The frequency. What's the frequency, Kenneth? Right, but it's not the frequency since he got there. It's the frequency since the beginning of AEW on TV. I just want to clarify that. Well, it's each person that's got there. Yeah, it's when each person got there. Adam Page was there from the start. What What are you not picking up on this that I'm laying down to Because you, when we originally talked about it on the show, we said it's about when Daniel Garcia first got there. There's no one who's had more matches on TV since he first got there. So I just want to stipulate that's not what this is. Oh, uh, well, apparently you're right. <laughs> that is what you said. What? Well, we're <laughs> Now that we've taken the complete piss out of all this mathematical business that Peter has done over there in Milford Haven, Pembrokeshire, United Kingdom, I'll still give you the statistics that we've got to work with. How's that? Because you may still be right. There may be, since he showed up, there may not have been anybody on TV more often. But because Peter went to a lot of trouble. Punk has had 17 matches. 
14 on Dynamite, 3 on Rampage in 274 days. That means he's had a match every 16.1 days. Wow. Interesting. So, oh, did I get to Twinkle Toes? No, you were I, going to, and I interrupted you. I was going Twinkle Toes. Yeah, you do that a lot. 49 matches on Dynamite, 2 on Rampage in 763 days, which was shortened due to injury, but he was on track. He was having a match every 15 days. So he actually stopped the clock with Kenny Omega when he got injured, not up to yes. this point. Yeah. Because even though he's not doing what you asked him to do, he's he's trying. Brian Danielson, 21 matches on Dynamite and eight matches on Rampage in 257 days. He's had a that's a match every 8.9 days. He's the he's the award winner there. Because FTR only tag team matches. Think about this. 726 days, two years. They've only had 38 tag team matches on television, 35 on Dynamite and three on Rampage. But that is a match every 19.1 days. But in two years, they were only on, uh, let's say 104, they were on somewhere around a third of the TV shows. Uh, Wardlow's a match every 24.6 days. Darby Allen every 21.1 days. Jay Lethal every 33.5 days in 201 days, which is se almost seven months. He's had four matches on Dynamite and two on Rampage. So basically, only Twinkle Toes, Page, Punk, and Danielson have been used more often than Mr. Garcia. But uh, but he, he closes, he has to assume that old Danny has got some pictures of someone in a compromising situation or taking some compromising substances. But who am I to guess? I'm just a simple country chicken lawyer. <laughs> well, they, they, have, they have more specialized categories over there in the UK. You can't just be a small town country bird lawyer. You have to specialize. Are we going with eagles? Are we going with starlings? Are we going with chickens? You got to specify the kind of bird you want. Well, there was that. A very interesting research there, but it still does not answer the question. So the question is still out there. Has anyone wrestled more frequently on TV since he got there? That is the question you were asking. Well, you were asking it too. And you could, well, and, but you continue to, to ask it <laughs> now, whereas I'm, I'm over it at this point. All right. It's been there a lot. Did I say condolences to Jared from St. Louis? I've just found this email. No, I don't think you did. I don't think we did. Uh, Jared in St. Louis, condolences. His grandfather died on Memorial Day, and he was never a big wrestling fan, but he knew that Jared was, and he started watching <laughs> NXT 2.0 so he could call Jared and laugh at the shenanigans that he was seeing. I'm sure that was a culture shock for him as an actual wrestling fan. But anyway, uh, Jared is trying to stay upbeat and our condolences. I didn't mean to overlook that one when I was on the subject earlier. We've got an update on another topic of conversation we've engaged in recently. When I took my little trip, we talked about hotel rooms and, and how skeeved out I was by the fact they never changed the filters in the air conditioning units and you asked if I walked barefoot on the carpet, et cetera, et cetera. And we were talking about whether to lay on the sheets or the comforter or keep your clothes on and put plastic over the bed or what exactly to do, right? Well, we have actually, this is from Felix from El Paso. And it's not the Felix that wrestles with Penthouse on AEW. This guy listens to the program. Mr. Cornette. And Brian. See, at least you're in there. I just heard your rant about the Hilton Hotel. Actually, I didn't. I mentioned it was a Hilton chain of properties. Uh, and also, it was more ranting about the air conditioning unit and or the non-working clock. But nevertheless, we talked about the, the bed sheets and the laundry as well. I just heard your rant about the Hilton Hotel. I want to give you a few tidbits of information about the laundry at the Hilton Hotel since I worked for a Hilton Hotel as a laundry supervisor for a few months. So apparently they have somebody in charge of that type of thing over there. Number one, 
Sheets, bath towels, bath mats, face towels, or any other terry cloth products are cleaned beyond regular use. If any of those have a stain, they go into a discard pile. The second most washed items are the blankets. That's the blanket that is usually stored in the closet. <laughs> if you want a clean one, call down and ask for a blanket. Most of the time, the porter working as room service goes down to the laundry facility and gets a clean one. So ignore the blanket in your closet. The third most washed items are the shower curtains and the bed comforters. Usually those are washed when a light stain or a visible stain can be seen. Now, I know that I've seen notifications a few years ago, the last time I was in hotels, and at least I think it was the Hampton Inn, where they were just waving their arms and screaming around that they washed their comforters after every use. It may, it may have been a new customer. They may have just been lying. Number four, this is good to hear. Anything with feces or blood goes into a biohazard bag. What else would you do with it? Would you send it down to fucking to the bar for a drink? And the number five, the one thing I never saw washed in my months there at an 800 room hotel were the, the mattress covers, the thing that goes between the sheets and the mattress. Think about that. That's never washed. So all you've got in between you and the sweat of 10,000 fuckers is that thin little sheet. And number six from Felix, they underpay the shit out of the employees for the work they do while the heiress cunt Paris was having a million dollar wedding. There it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> That's everything you need to know about the hotel laundry at the Hilton chain, courtesy of Felix from El Paso. Okay. What chain would you like to investigate next, Brian? What chain of hotels? Sure. Double what are we going to dig into? Double, double tree. tree? I can tell you some stories off air about the double tree down in Orlando. People could get in trouble. Speaking of Orlando, Florida, and parts adjacent to them, we've apparently hit on a gold mine of controversial material here with the stories from the fans going to Hogan's Beach Shop in, I think there's one in Clearwater, and I think there's one in Orlando. Is there not? Is that what we've learned? Oh, I don't know. I didn't realize they had begun the franchising process. Well, I, th I think there is, there's more than one, but the one that we've been talking about, the one in Clearwater apparently is managed, run by Ron, not Opie or Richie Howard, and he is, his interactions with the customers have led some of them to write us and recount those. So we've got a few more now, and we've now we're, we're getting... We're getting the positive and the negative because few people have ragged on him. But now we've also got some people taken up for him. And the first one, though, an OG member of the cult, Lee Petrie. Lee has actually been there. And we know Lee. This is not just some fictitious bot out there. And Lee says, gentlemen, I have made my way to Hogan's Beach Shop in Clearwater, Florida on a few occasions in my travels. And while you've already covered most of the shenanigans spawned by Ron, not Opie or Richie Howard, <laughs> I thought I'd pass along a few nuggets that haven't been discussed as of yet. Number one, as for the 84 belt being authentic and costing $1,000, it's simply the silver and black belt with the black strap, not the big green. It was available on their website for a while, too, and it is an awful replica. <laughs> Number two. Ron is a fast-talking guy and loves to drop stories about hanging with Hogan, Jimmy Hart, and other locals and something to say about everyone. And if you were to picture what he looks and sounds like, it's very reminiscent of one Mr. Meltzer. Number three, and my favorite. In a discussion about some of the more unique items in the store, Ron mentioned to me that, quote, Vince lets Hulk do anything he wants with NWO merchandise, unquote. <laughs> 
To, to that end, there are some NWO items in the store that are not the trademarked logo and appear to be sold outside of the WWE's purview. Do you think Vince is letting Hogan do anything he wants with NWO merchandise in general, uh, Brian? Do you think there's any wrestler ever that Vince has said, go do whatever you want with my intellectual property? Um, I don't think he, there's anybody in life that he's ever said you can do anything you want with anything to. But Lee ends one last note. Looking at the site, Hogan's Beach Shop currently has the Ric Flair commemorative title and robe selling for $5,000. Let the buyer beware. Regards, Lee Petrie. But now... But now there's there's more because we got a an email from Jojo from Lafayette, Louisiana. Jim and Brian, I'd like to first of all say I've been listening to the show for a few years now, and you have one of the most entertaining wrestling podcasts out there. While I always don't agree with your views, Jim, I respect the decades you have put into the wrestling business. It's a testament to your love for the industry. So see, he's trying to ingratiate himself. I saw the two YouTube clips about Hogan's Beach Shop and Ron Howard. I've been going to Hogan's Beach Shop since the grand opening in October of 2012. I go to Clearwater Beach two to three times a year. Not once has anyone there ever claimed that the big green belt is the original. Hogan has stated many times that he doesn't know where it is and that it's probably in a dumpster somewhere. The beach shop sells replicas of most belts Hulk has won throughout his illustrious career. They do have the 1986 belt, the Bash at the Beach Jarrett belt, among others, that are original and not for sale. You can hold them for a picture for around $20. I've, we've heard $20, $25, $50, hundred. I have known Ron for 10 years. He's a nice guy. And I've personally seen him accommodate many of their guests, especially the young and handicapped. The stories from those... <laughs> well, I mean, he's, he's, and now, see, we're hearing... Another side of the coin, no. maybe everything's okay with Ron. Maybe if somebody just caught him on a bad day. The stories from those two other guests seem exaggerated at the least. Like myself, Ron is a strong Republican and Trump supporter. Oh, okay. But in no way does that make him a bad guy. Yes, in every way, in every single way that you can be a bad guy, that makes him one. Uh, but he says, uh, go, Jojo says, maybe you sh guys should make a trip down there yourselves. Go on a Monday <laughs> and, ch and check out a Hogan's Hangout, his restaurant a few doors down. What did he buy, a strip mall? And just Hogan is there every Monday for karaoke with Jimmy Hart and other special guests. Ric Flair has been there multiple times now, as he now lives in Tampa. Dennis Rodman, Brooke and Nick Hogan, Brian Knobs, among others, make appearances as well. It'll be the time of your life, Jim. Oh, my God. Oh, all I want to do is go and hang out with a couple of fucking Trump suckers and Brooke and Nick Hogan and Dennis Rodman. Don't forget Brian Knobs. Knobs ain't a bad guy. Oh, I'm sure he'll be a blast. Well, he, I didn't say I'd be there long. But he, <laughs> I've never had any issues. Well, so we got that. So now there's another side of the coin, but almost completely through the thing when he had me on the hook for that. Maybe old Ron Howard wasn't such a bad guy, that he's, but he's obviously he's a Trump supporter and whatever. Well, anyway. But now to bookend this, and we've done a reverse Stewie Griffin compliment sandwich. We're going to go back to the credible reporters. This is Devin from Martin, Kentucky. Hello, Mr. Cornette and Mr. Last. We're starting to get some more respect for you, Brian. Devin says, I've got another story about the manager at Hogan's Beach Shop, Ron Howard. I was vacationing in Florida with my family in December of last year, and I convinced them to take a trip to Hogan's Beach Shop. What a mistake that fucking idea was. We all wear masks, and the moment we walked in the door, the manager, who I came to find out was Ron Howard, began glaring at us. My 12-year-old younger brother was looking at wrestling toys in the corner, and I noticed Ron was talking to him. I walked over slightly just so I could hear him, and he was telling him roughly this. Sh what, wait a minute. <clears throat> Hold on. He, he, uh, sheep those damn masks. So he, I think this was possibly his computer, because he started and ended the sentence with sheep. Those damn masks are mind-controlling agents that make people into the government sheep. Wearing oh that thing God. is their way of penetrating your mind. 
It was at this point I walked over and tried to politely take attention away from my brother without telling this, but how stupid he was. I asked him about some of the Hulk Hogan autograph posters and the prices he had on them. The first thing he did say was, anything with Hogan's autograph can easily sell for over $300, but I'll give you a deal on the posters. If you want one, I'll let you have it for $200, and you can take a photo with the real WCW world title for $50. Before I could say no thanks, and believe me, I couldn't get it out fast enough, he started spewing even more conspiracies and crazy theories. Quote, You know, by 2023, the electoral system will be completely run by computers giving us no right to vote. Joe Biden isn't really the real Joe Biden. Whoever is surgically manipulated to look like him is shorter, has bigger ears, and smaller eyes. They plan on taking control of our children through the media, and the masks are the first step. The government is starting to put tracking chips in all the masks, and soon those will control how people think. He went on a lot longer, but I don't want to relive much more of it. The thing I remember most about the experience was explaining to him that I wear masks because I have been concerned about COVID since day one. He refuted and claimed he had the virus three times. We've heard this in another email. And, uh, and it never affected him because of natural immunity. He explained masks are useless until I pointed out the red Hogan masks that were hanging for sale in the store. We left in a hurry. And his brother told him once they left the store that the little brother said that Ron started con trying to convince him to take off his mask and he'll let him hold Hogan's belt. <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're getting conflicting stories, but I tend to believe the ones that we get most often, especially when the only one actually taken up for him came out and admitted he was a Republican and Trump voter. And says that he saves puppies and he kisses dolphins or whatever else they said in that email. Well, if you want to, if you want to kiss a dolphin, that's up to you because these these things are allowed in certain circumstances. But make sure that you check the dolphin's ID first. He helps the handicapped and he walks old women across the street. Sometimes they don't even want to go, but he gets them there. You got to admire persistence. I mentioned we have some etymology. For those of you who are not certain of what that is, that's the root source of words. It's the background, the origin stories of words. Because we mentioned this. What, what show was it and, and what fan brought it up? There was a question. And they said, how did Rib get, in, get to meet a practical joke in the wrestling business? Oh, that was on the drive-thru. It was about Rib and Stooge. Yes, Rib and Stooge. And I said, Rib was to my knowledge, was always uh, in mainstream use, in regular use, was if you're ribbing somebody, you're joking them, or you're messing with her, or whatever, it's a rib, right? And then that kind of stuck in wrestling after the mainstream usage, you know, went on to other things. Well, now we're from Jeremy of wherever the fuck he didn't say. <laughs> rib is a verb and it means to dupe, tease, or fool. By n This was used in this fashion by 1930, apparently from rib noun, which is attested to by 1929 or before, in a slang sense of a joke, perhaps a figurative use of poking someone in the ribs, rib digging, a.k.a. light-hearted banter, is attested to by 1925. So there you have, you poke somebody in the ribs, you're ribbing them, it's a joke, now you're duping them, you're teasing them, you're fooling them around the mid-20s into the 30s. That's why I said those old 30s and 40s gangster movies, the snappy patter, or the Howard Hawks movies with the quick patter, they use a lot of slang. You know, that's it was mainstream at that point. It stuck in wrestling and then moved on elsewhere. But now we have some dates, some firm dates and, and a tracing of this thing. Very enlightening, very eye-opening. They're not ribbonous. No, they're not. You got anything going on over there? This is your show. This is your show. I'm just enjoying it like all the listeners. <laughs> all right, should we should we move on over into some of the wrestling that we saw this 
next week. Why do that when we can talk more about word origins? What word? Did you hear, by the way? Did you hear about this? Hear about the word? Yeah. The bird? Bird. The bird is the word. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. What are we just vamping now until you get me, let, let me get you out of this? I didn't realize I was in it. If I'm in it, please get me out of it. <laughs> All righty. We're going to talk about a little wrestling. And the first thing we're going to talk about is something that wasn't on any of the programs we've watched over the last few days, but news that has come out that may or may not be true because I believe I know where it was originally reported. And so therefore I'm going to have to wait and see for myself if it manifests itself or if other people have more details on this. But apparently what's being reported about the change in the group, the Judgment Day, Edge's group of himself, Rhea Ripley, Damian Priest, and now Finn Balor, and we had just, my God, they looked good, and we were enjoying the shit. I was enjoying the shit and wanted to see more of it, and they finally got something that's a little intriguing going on, and Edge is the key of the whole thing. He's the straw that stirs the drink, as Ric Flair would say, and what did they do last week on Monday? If Monday night is not raw, it's at least irritated, and, and it's it's like... The shingles. Now, it's not really raw. It's it's just erupted into the shingles. They kicked Edge out of the group. They all to Finn Balor is apparently now the leader of the group because he's the one that came in and punched fucking Edge in the face and they kicked him out. So, so now they're floundering the Judgment Day with two talents that should be elevated. One that's been beaten to death over the past several months and Edge has been excommunicated. You brought up, and there's possibly something to this, Brian, that Vince probably said, okay, well, you've done this thing with the Judgment Day, you want to do Edge, but Cody's out and we need a top babyface. That sounds like something Vince would do and deprive of us of a group that we liked. But now it's being reported that Edge went to the office, creative, and complained about the fact, if it is true, that they want to make Judgment Day, the group, give them supernatural elements. And Edge, apparently, according to this story, went and said, no, please, let's not do that and ruin this whole goddamn thing. And days later, they kicked him out of the group. Because as of, as of the pay-per-view, he was still tweeting, come join us. And the next night, he gets kicked out of it, out of the blue, without any rhyme or reason. So the only way to be able to know for sure is if at some point over the next several weeks, if either Balor or Rhea or Damian Priest start teleporting or grow fangs or turn into a werewolf or howl by the light of the silvery moon then we're going to know that it was true. And if that's the case, how fuck, not only being stupid to make any of these people with tremendous upsides supernatural in any fashion, but when the guy that started the group, a Hall of Famer, 20-something year veteran, comes and personally says, that would be really fucking stupid, what do you do? You kick him out of the group that he started to begin with. He just got a haircut. And he just got a haircut. So now they were together for six weeks. So the breakup meant nothing. We just got a, a little taste of how it might be good to have these three together because they look so professional. Then they bring Balor in, which in my opinion weighed the fucking thing down because it should have been Edge converting the minds of these young up-and-comers that they can do better under him, and they would, but Finn Balor's already been as far as he's going to go in that company, and he's been on the downhill slide for a while now, so that doesn't make any sense. And then they're going to try to make Edge a babyface. They've already said they've moved him over to the babyface side of the roster. So let me get this straight. The guy that for the last three months, since he was a babyface three months ago, 
has been trying his hardest to make us believe that he's lost his mind, he's become an evil person, he's convinced other people to join him, and he's twisted their minds around in search of glory and greatness, and it's all about them, and he's evil, and he's a cult leader, he's a mind fucker. But now they punched him and kicked him and hit him in the head with a chair, so we'll forget all that. He's a great guy. The fuck? That doesn't even make any sense. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have made sense in the territories. It doesn't even make sense now. So, I mean, could they be that stupid? Could this really be true? You know, it made me think about a story we had heard a little bit about a little while back. You know, when Bray Wyatt left, we all assumed, I shouldn't say we all, but a lot of people assumed that much of the supernatural stuff was coming from him. And then word came out a few months back, we talked about on one of the shows, that even he was upset with all the supernatural stuff, that he didn't want to do all that. What about the idea that now they're pushing it on another wrestler who doesn't need it? The last thing this thing needed was a supernatural element. Yes, last. The idea that this push is coming from inside WWE, it's coming from someone in that brain trust to keep going to the supernatural, hocus-pocus, horror show stuff, what does that tell you? It's coming from inside the house. That's what I'm... This is a wrestling war that both sides are trying as hard as possible to lose. And if we do something stupid, well, goddamn... They'll do something stupid the next week on TV. And one top star gets hurt in one company. Well, the other top star, it, it just on down the line. Neither company, anytime anything looks good, they will screw it up on their own. The injuries aren't their fault, obviously. But they'll screw up the booking on their own. Anytime anybody gets something going on that's interesting or using somebody that might have something or can get over or just in any way make this a serious professional production on either side. Eh. So we'll see. Maybe Rhea Ripley will grow a wart on her nose and become a witch. What do they do to Edge? Do you think they punish him for something like this? Well, they already have. <laughs> They took him out of his group, and now they've made him a baby face, and now he's he's obviously going to have to work a program with the same guys that he was just mentoring, or it means nothing. So, I, I mean, or do they just beat him up, and then he goes and wrestles Roman Reigns, Edge? Is that the way that's going to go? I don't understand how they got a top baby face out of this. They just lost their good heel group. The only ones happy about this are the House of Black. Now they'll, now they're like, see, we we'll be the best after all, just because the other guys ain't doing it anymore. So now we have to sit here and anticipate Rhea, Damian Priest, and Finn Balor, what having the ability to shoot lightning out of their fingers. I don't know what they're going to be able to do, but these three people all of a sudden now, after being on their show for years, are going to have powers somehow. Why? What you didn't know? Rhea Ripley does have magic powers. No, I did not. You weren't aware of that? Yeah. We were driving down the road one day in my car. She touched my leg. I turned into a motel. I just got off the phone with Rhea Ripley, and she wanted me to say, you are about to be canceled, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Rhea. Let me hang up the phone. You can't cancel me. I quit. But you know, Brian, there's something else that makes things magically disappear. Do you know what that is? No, what's that? That is the Performance Package 4.0 from our friends at Manscaped, because Father's Day is just around the corner coming up, and our friends at Manscaped have put together the Performance Package 4.0, so all of your crotch rot will disappear. All of the weeds, and all of the, the vines, and all of the stench, and the swamp that populates most male nether regions, it'll be cleared, it'll be pumped, it'll be seeded and sodded it'll be good as new thanks to the performance package 4.0 for father's day or any day but i'll tell you what folks i know if you're a a son or a daughter or a sister or a brother or a father or a mother 
or a grandfather or a grandmother or any relation to or a friend of or in any social circle of or possibly even a neighbor of a guy who may or may not be a father, they're going to want the performance package 4.0. There are 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with taking care of their crotches. And you can too. Especially all that old man hair that pops up from head to toe. They're going to take care of everything. First of all, the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. That's the official MVP of Father's Day. It's a fourth generation trimmer with a cutting edge ceramic blade. We shouldn't use the word cutting down there. With a space age ceramic blade that reduces grooming accidents. It's waterproof. It's got a 400K LED spotlight. You know, oftentimes when it gets dark late at night, Harley has to go out and piss. I'll take the lawnmower and use that LED light to keep track of her in the dark. And it's also good for reading in bed with the lights out. And also, I wouldn't use it for any of those reasons, folks. I would use it the way it's intended to be used. Well, you can do that if you want to, but if you, if you need if you need to read or find something in the dark or no. You know, sometimes well, you know, they've also they've got the the uh, the Crop Reserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Toner and the Performance Boxer Brief and the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer. Sometimes you use your LED spotlight on the lawnmower to look up your nose so that you can trim those weeds in there with your Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer. You never know. If you look into holes, cracks, and crevices, you never know what you're going to see that needs attention. And that's why these things have lights. They've got a magnifying glass you can add on to this thing. But anyway, they've also just launched the launched or launched the brand new Boxers 2.0. <laughs> They're the best boxers ever. Fuck George Foreman. <laughs> Fuck Muhammad Ali. These are the best boxers because dads love comfort. And the Boxers 2.0 are packed with revolutionary features. Have you ever had your underwear packed? Brian, have you ever been impacted in your underwear? They're packed with revolutionary features, including the jewel pouch trademark. It's designed to cradle the boys. As we've mentioned, I thought this was special sauce. I've misread the copy last week. Cradling your boys in their own special space, which I guess is more comfortable than if they were being cradled in your own special sauce. But it's game changer time for the undies, undies, the underwear. So, whether you're mowing the lawn or taking out the trash or golfing in the sun, these moisture-wicking boxers breathe without breaking a sweat. But i got to be perfectly honest with you. I love the Manscaped products. I use all of them myself. They send us samples of everything. I've never had a problem, and they're, they're wonderful products. But if your father is out there mowing the lawn or taking out the trash or golfing while he's wearing his fucking boxers, somebody's going to call the cops. You're going to need to <laughs> encourage him to put on some pants over the boxers and a shirt as well. I would encourage sitting around the house reading the newspaper on Sunday in the boxers, but I wouldn't take out the trash, mow the lawn, walk the dog, and, and, and you know, don't go out with the, some, some of the female neighbors may be upset. But right now, sons, buy this for you and your dad if you're over the age of reason. Ladies, buy this for your man. Dog daddies, you deserve this treat too. Dogs out there, buy this performance package 4.0 for your daddy. If you're a dog, can dogs use the manscaped.com website? They don't have opposable thumbs. No, dogs well, are not using the internet yet, no. Well, whether it's Augie Doggy or Doggy Daddy, everybody, does. whether, you, whether you're a low-down, dirty dog or whether you just like to dog things. You know, there's a meaning of dogging what? in England that they're <laughs> the people in England now are going, Oh, they're going out dogging. Anyway, just cut all the hair off your crotch with manscaped.com. If you go right now to manscaped.com and we encourage you to, while they're still with us, they will give you 20% off and free shipping of anything you want to buy on the whole website. If you use the code DRIVE, D-R-I-V-E, just like we're doing now, driving them away as potential sponsors. Manscaped.com, use the code DRIVE for 20% off and free shipping for Father's Day. And as a matter of fact, if any of you fathers want to father anything else, 
you better shave some of, some of that shit off and get rid of that stank or you're not going to be able to inseminate anyone again. Because uh, some of these women out in the world today have certain standards. So kick it up a notch. Manscaped.com. Well, I guess we might as well talk about some of the wrestling now, right? You know, Brian, every time I just wait from one of these shows to the next, I just fritter my time away just waiting to watch these shows with bated breath. And, and there's a word you don't hear enough of these days, fritter. Nobody fritters away things anymore. Ticking away the moments that make up a dull day, you fritter and waste the hours in an offhand way, kicking around on a piece of ground in your hometown, waiting for someone or something to show you the way. Nobody says fritter. Isn't it awful that Jake has kind of ruined Pink Floyd for me? <laughs> but anyway. You know, that was the... <laughs> you know what I'm talking that about. Was, that, was, yeah, that was the song <laughs> when Jake no-showed me uh, in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I called up and on his answering machine was the tune, I have become comfortably numb. Anyway, on SmackDown... <laughs> it's the greatest way to no-show I've ever heard yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I thought mine was pretty good for uh, several weeks after I left Ring of Honor at the end of 2012, and nobody really knew, because I just said, I'm just going to wait and see if anybody misses me. I had put Peter Frampton, I can't stand it no more, I'm going away, I can't stand it no more, I'm leaving today. Nobody picked up on it. Anyway, SmackDown is what we were talking about. We're going to talk about, this is from June the 10th on the Friday night. They were in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I just thought 40 years ago, the fans would have kicked the shit out of most of the guys on the fucking card. Baton Rouge was not a, uh, not an easy place. We got, we almost got sued there one time. We did get sued, but the guy sued the city as well. He sued the Midnight Express and me and Mid-South Wrestling and Jimmy Kilshaw, the local promoter, and the Baton Rouge Centriplex, the arena, and the city of Baton Rouge because they own the Centriplex. And as a result, we one night walked across the street from the Centriplex to a lawyer's office that they had told us to go talk to. And, and this is the, I never even hit this fucking guy. He's the guy that I never, he hit me and I tried to hit him. And Dundee's the one that beat shit out of him, and I threw back my racket and whacked a cop in the head. We talked to the lawyer. He said, I don't think you're going to have a lot of trouble with this, and we never heard another word about it. Try to sue the city in any city in Louisiana and see how far you get. So anyway, they were in Baton Rouge is where they were. Did you watch any of this program, Brian? You zipped through it at least. I zipped through it. I did watch a couple of matches in complete. But I zipped through the rest of the show. And then actually after the matches I wanted to see, I just turned off the show. Yeah. Well, Drew and Seamus with his buddy Butch was the first match. Haven't we seen these guys like incessantly for years now? Uh, it ended in a pull apart with camera work so peripatetic and erratic that I got a headache and had to look away because I was going to lose my dinner from last night. And that was the first 25 minutes of this two-hour program, was this match and aftermath. And then I was brought further down. They had a big report, a big package on Cody's injury and surgery, and he's now going to be out nine months. Nine months. He's going to be out three times as long as if he'd have broken his leg. That's how bad and, and tough and, and slow healing these muscle and tendon tears and injuries are. But now we, can, we had one thing to look forward to in this company. Otherwise, it, it, I've come to realize with the WWE, it's so whitewashed and scrubbed and sanitized. It's like watching people fight through a window. You kind of, you're seeing what's going on, but you can't really kind of get involved in it because it just, it's just there. On the topic of Cody's injury, you want to know who I'm putting my money on winning the Royal Rumble? Who? Cody Rhodes. <laughs> Nine months. He'll be back for the Rumble. Oh, uh, but goddamn, we got to, we got to make it to the Rumble. Jesus. Actually, nine months. It's a little Rumble less than the Rumble. January. 
No, I think they're gonna try. I think they're gonna try to get him back for the Rumble. If anything, otherwise you're gonna debut him in between the Rumble and WrestleMania. That would be tough. So it's eight months to the Rumble. Eight months to the Rumble. Maybe they'll start the Cody countdown clock now with months, <laughs> weeks, days, hours, minutes, seconds. God damn it. I wrote that on my notes. God damn it. Nine months we got to go. All right. Lacey Evans is on SmackDown now. And she did a promo, and it wasn't the hostage statement that, you know, they've stood her up in front of a wall and made her give those awkward promos about her childhood stories this was better delivery because it was more motivational current modern she's got the patriotic gear she does the salute on her entrance they're trying to she's a female sergeant slaughter and she's got some size and she looked like she was a little more comfortable you know doing this promo about herself rather than as i said talking about the you know, the horrible stories of her childhood. We've got that established now, so let's move on. So I was thinking, I'm going to watch this match because now we just need to see if she can wrestle. Because when she was the Southern Belle, she would just come out, twirl her parasol, and turn around and go back, right? Yeah, she waved a lot, and then she would walk away. Waved a lot. So now we're going to see her wrestle. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to evaluate this. Well, she wrestled Zia Lee. And they did a brief shine, and then Zali started kicking her ass. And I can't tell if Lacey Evans can work because she's trying to wrestle a four and a half foot tall kung fu movie star wannabe, doing the leg sweeps and kicks. And Carton, there was no wrestling involved on Zali's part. So if she was a badass kick-ass looking person or some type of Sayama level tiger mask, you know, defying gravity type of thing. Okay. But it would just, this wasn't the way to showcase Lacey Evans big debut as a wrestler on this program again, in a new gimmick with Zia Lee. And again, she a brief shine, not two minutes of heat. Lacey makes a e eh, comeback because there was, because some awkwardness to that, too. You can't be smooth trying to deal with all the quick kicks and everything. She did a weird headstand onto the turnbuckle into a butt drop on Zia Lee's chest. And then Zia Lee started to take back over and hit the ropes. <laughs> and Evans just hit her with a fucking Ronnie Garvin hands of stone right coming off the ropes and dropped her. Boom. One, two, three. So her finish is a knockout punch, and it didn't look too bad. I think Cam Rangel had a big part to play in it, and I still have no idea whether this girl can work or not because you couldn't tell against Zia Lee. So what would you think? I think they called the finish, was it either the woman's right or a woman's right? <laughs> Which is pretty funny. <laughs> I, I, I Hopefully that will be something that won't make it to... Next week, that's a little ridiculous, but... I like Zia Lee's entrance. It's right out of The Last Dragon, so it's right down my alley. Uh, the match was what it was. It's the WWE women's division, and these are not two of the better women in it. And I like Zia Lee, but like you pointed out some of the problems with her work. I guess my only issue was they kind of... Maybe I picked up on it wrong. But when Lacey Evans won, it was kind of... She sold it like, I can't believe it. I've finally gotten here, and I've won on TV. It's like we're supposed to forget about the fact she was the Southern Belle <laughs> out there shaking her ass and everything. This would well, be a lot to, more to effective. Fair, this would be a lot more effective if we hadn't already seen her on TV with a failed gimmick. Well, to be fair, nobody else remembers that because it was so forgettable. But I mean, at least they took her off TV for a while. What was that? Two years ago, she was a bell. Uh, but uh, they didn't just change it from one week to another like they do lately. Ronda Rousey, are we going <laughs> to, are the people going to start calling her Ronda Lousy? It, she goes to the ring for a live in-ring promo. She's wearing the demon eye makeup. It's even more pronounced. So it, it, is this when she's, not exercised, but when she is um, possessed 
by some demon? Does it come out in her eye makeup and other times other personalities take over and she softens it up a little bit? She starts doing a promo in the ring and it's prepared material, obviously, about the pay-per-view, the Money in the Bank match coming up. But it's like she's being forced to do this interview because somebody is holding a family member hostage until she finishes. It doesn't look like she wants to be in there, does it, when she's speaking? Not at all. She doesn't look like she wants to be there at all. This whole run and this whole run has seemed like she was forced to be there and she doesn't want to be there. So, you know, maybe they got, what is her husband, Travis Brown? They've got Travis tied up in the back. You know, the backstage area, dangerous place in wrestling. But she spoke for 30 seconds and not very convincingly. And then here comes Shotzi. And she brought some life into it because she still was reciting, you know, verbiage she was given, but it sounded like she wanted to be there and she was trying. And the challenge was asked and answered. And they had a match. And Ronda won with an arm bar. And, I mean, you know... Again, from the interview, you would have taken Rhonda as the heel with the pouty face and the demeanor that she couldn't be bothered, but what, you know, the demon eye makeup, and then here comes Shotzi and the people cheer because there's something going on with some energy to it. And then as soon as Rhonda wins, Natalia, her opponent, Ed Money in the Bank jumps her from behind. So apparently from, from the setup to this, Rousey came off as the heel and Shotzi came off as the babyface, but then as soon as the heel beats the babyface, then she's attacked from behind by another heel and Natalia puts her in a sharpshooter and won't let it go and there are three referees, a female referee and two grown adult male referees standing there begging her to let go of Ronda Rousey, but doing nothing and not even touching Natalia. I can understand if it's goddamn Joe LaDuke with the bear hug or some giant monster with some hold. You're, please, please let him go. It's a fucking, it's a 150-pound girl and there's two men there. Pull her off. I, I, this show was already dismal. Dismal. What'd you think of this whole production? I fast forwarded through it because <laughs> Ronda Rousey has lost any star quality to me. She doesn't want to be there, or at least she doesn't appear to want to be there. They use her in ways that don't really make her seem like she's anything special. She went from being a really special wrestler on the roster to being just another person on the roster. I didn't care at all. And I knew it wasn't going to be worth me not fast-forwarding through. I just knew it. I couldn't have said it better myself, so I will move on without saying any more of it. Because the next match was what I wanted to see from last week that was advertised as, okay. And remember, I believe I told you, bet the farm on the result that I called. If anybody did bet the farm, then they're fucking happy today because they're rolling in money. The Intercontinental title, Ricochet against Walter Gunter. By the way, is the Intercontinental title belt one of the ugliest championship belts that you have ever seen? When was the last time WWE did not have an ugly belt? They're all ugly it's belts. Just, it's abysmal. It looks like the AWA belt after Hanson ran over it with his tractor. Anyway, so I wanted to see this match, and obviously this is going to be the next step in Walter's push. He's going to win the Intercontinental title. So he has a belt. He's already got his henchman, Ludwig Gable Williams, or whatever his fucking name is, at ringside with him. And they go 90 seconds of this match. Ricochet ducks and dodges a bit, and Valter takes over with one chop that leveled him and started mauling him. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And they go to the break. 90 seconds in, I'm like, what the fuck? So they come back from the break. And at that point, Walter is giving Ricochet a couple of hope spots, and he does sell for smaller guys without going too far well, Walter does. 
he staggers and he flummoxes and it's like, oh, he's got me off balance, but he's not kicking my ass. He's very smart. However, they let this go far enough that toward the end, I thought he was giving Ricochet too much foolishness and staggering around too much. I'm wanting just swat him out of the fucking air and beat him and let's get to the business of this, which is basically finally what he did. He hit a drop kick that just knocked Ricochet ass over tea kettle and power bombed him one, two, three. And I know they were, okay, the guy's the champion. We're beating him, so let's give him some offense at the end. But, I mean, he's a foot shorter than Valter. He's 100 pounds lighter. And let's face it, Valter's a star. Ricochet is on the card. So I think this should have been, it shouldn't have been any longer, but it should have been a little one, more one-sided. But why they needed a commercial break in the middle, since this wasn't any more than five minutes, I don't know, you know, why. but. Again, so far, they have not got Volter doing Saturday Night Live sketches, so that's a plus. Every time I see him, he's slimmer than the time before. Thank you for that incisive commentary. What are you, his nutrition? Every time I see him, he's noticeably slimmer than he was the time before, and it really is something because when we first started seeing him, it was, oh my God, imagine him in WWE or in the States. A guy that looks like that, a guy that could be physically imposing even though he's not cut. And he's still a big guy, but look at how trim he is now. I like it. I really, because part of it's going to help with Vince because Vince doesn't like guys that don't have a physique. And he did have a lot of meat on him. And he could still move and he could still work and do all of his stuff at that size. But now his cardio's got to be better. He does look, he looks like he's tanning too. So he's doing the things that Vince is going to like cosmetically. But he still reminds me of a killer Kowalski or a Gene Kaniski. Or a, the, those arms are so long, the hands are so big, he hits so hard. You hear him when he lays hands on people. The body language and everything, I like the lean look because he still is so convincing. And, and now it looks like he can go forever. So with that height and the length of those arms and those big paws, you know, I'm, I'm fine with it. And I just, I, I think if they don't screw him up, he's so different and he's so much more polished of a performer than almost everybody else on the roster at doing what he should be doing that if they don't fuck him up, he, he'll be big. I will say also, I like, uh, what's his name? His name is now Ludwig. I like him in the corner. He doesn't break. He holds that face and that look the whole match. I've kind of liked that part of it, too. He's like the uh, the fucking chauffeur of the commandant of the Stalag yeah. in the in the <laughs> World War II movie. That's right. A little, little shystery-looking fucking shady character. So then we were ready for the main event of SmackDown. Yes, that's right, folks. What we have just related to you was the rest of the program, except the main event was Sami Zayn versus Riddle. If Sami was to win, then Riddle would be barred from SmackDown, but if Riddle would win, that he would get a match with Roman Reigns next week on TV. And as a result, Paul Heyman was on color. And I gave serious thought to watching this, but then here, remember we timed uh, Raw the other night it was 19 minutes from the time that one of the girls began their entrance to the time the bell for their match actually rang. Well, they had some competition here. Sami Zayn started making his entrance at 9.25 Eastern time, right? 9.25. By the time they went from that to video packages and breaks and announcer resets and breaks again and another video and blah, 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 and Riddle's entrance, and the giraffes flew out of his ass, and another break, and another package. The bell rang. Okay, Sammy versus Riddle. Sammy starts to the ring at 925. What time, Brian, did the bell ring to start the main event? You said 925? Yeah. Based on what we did last week, 940. 
942. Wow. 17 minutes. And somebody emailed me, and I, I forgot to print it out, or I'd read, I'll try to find it. But basically the gist is somebody that's gone to these tapings actually wrote me because I said, what are they fucking doing? Is there a goddamn lounge under the ring? What's Where are they going? They send the talent at stars, even stars. They send them out there. And then they get out of the ring and they stretch on the floor and they talk to the fans and they talk to the ringside TV crew and they do jumping jack, whatever the fuck. They're just out there. That would be, there is nothing more uncomfortable, especially when you're a heel, than having to go out there and stand in the ring and do nothing and wait for the camera to come to you. Because you're, you're, you're losing your fucking heat as the longer you're there. When you fir they first see you, they're going to be madder and they're going to scream and they're going to yell. But after you stand there, they've done it. And none of that's on camera. I used to hate that. But I can't imagine going out there. This is the kind of shit that guys in the, I know in the 80s and definitely in the, not definitely in the 90s, would have either yelled or refused to do or quit over is to, you want me to go out and stand in the ring doing nothing for 10 minutes in front of all the people? Can you hear Kevin Nash right now? Yeah, Vince, I'm going to go out there and stand in the ring for 10 minutes looking at the people and doing my fucking taxes, right? Fuck you. But that's, that's what they do. So then Sammy versus Riddle started with 18 minutes left in the show. And Heyman was on color, but I say, you know what? Not even to hear Heyman, am I going to give Riddle 18 minutes of my time? Did I miss anything, or did you see it? I was out after uh, the Gunther match. Okay, well, because that, that was the main event for us. So there you have the entirety of SmackDown from just last night, Friday night the 10th. And that's a two-hour program on network television. What... Uh, I mean, it, I always said, and it, this was kind of a rule of thumb, but, you know, it's been tested over the last several years. If you've got a local wrestling program on a television station in any market in the country, as long as it's a station that people can actually get on their television in one fashion or another, your local wrestling show will do a one rating. It won't do any less than a one because. That's what wrestling does. They're doing 2 million people by habit at this point. That's, I guess this is the equivalent of their one local rating because what in the world is there that would make you want to watch this program? Certainly not <clears throat> the commentary, certainly not the booking, certainly not the wrestling. It's a horrible show. It's impossible to watch. And I mean, it's tough to watch, but it's even tough to listen to. If only there was some kind of way that I could just at least deprive one of my senses of having to go through this, where maybe I could just, well, it wouldn't do good to hear the wrestling show because then you wouldn't actually be able to see the fuck-ups happening. But maybe if there's some way I could watch the wrestling show, but I could hear something else, like my mother-in-law's voice speaking to me, or the sound of someone disemboweling a cat, or something that's more entertaining than WWE SmackDown. Do you think there's some way I could watch one thing and listen to another, Brian? I not only think there is a way, I think you should use this way because anything's better than hearing Michael Cole scream at you like an idiot for a couple of hours. And of course, we know our fine friends at Raycon have a solution. Oh, I didn't even think about now, of course. How could I be so stupid? I didn't even think about the Raycon solution. That's what they call them. They call them everyday earbuds, but they ought to call it the Raycon solution because they will solve your problem. If you're listening to people or things or programs that you don't like and you don't want to listen to, fuck all that noise. Just stick a pair of the Raycon wireless earbuds in your ears, the everyday earbuds that look and feel and sound better than ever with the optimized gel tips, and you won't have to listen to those people drone on with their nonsense anymore. You'll hear exactly what you want to hear. You'll program your life, whether it's when you're working out, 
or whether it's when you're outside communing with nature. I mean, whatever, whatever you want to do with nature, it's up to you. However intimate or friendly you want to get with the woodland creatures, that's fine with me, but make sure you got Raycons in your ears when you do it. Except if you need to hear a police siren because you've gotten too intimate with the furry woodland creatures, then you might want to use the awareness mode because that lets you hear your surroundings or the noise isolation mode that lets you be immersed in sound. You can pick because Raycon, they believe in letting you choose what happens with your own brains and your own ears. And so therefore, even if they fall from three stories off a burning building or get lost in the rain or get thrown overboard on a cruise ship in the Antarctic, they'll still work afterwards. Give or take, if you threw them off a cruise ship in the Antarctic, I bet you're not going to find them. So we don't really know for sure if that works. But they've got over 49,000 five-star reviews. So there must be something going on. They couldn't have paid for all of those. Anyway, right now, if you want to check out Raycon's wireless earbuds that are available at half the price of the other premium audio brands with eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life, all you got to do is go to buyraycon.com slash J-C-E. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash J-C-E. You'll get 15% off your Raycon order. They just sent me and Stacy a couple of pair, and she's already started using them. She loves them. She can listen to anything. I actually put mine in last night before I went to bed and went to sleep, and she got the special kind for me to where there's a microphone attachment, and while you're sleeping, your significant other can speak to you while you're asleep and unconscious and in a a what is it? What do they call them? Rim states or ram states? Rapid eye or movement, yeah. Rim job state, whatever. That's not it is, what they call it. Nope. Where she tells me subliminal messages, and then when I wake up, for example, I got up out of bed took my morning Russo and immediately started shampooing the carpets just because of what she had told me through my Raycon wireless earbuds when I was asleep last night. So if you want to control people's minds, buy Raycon.com slash JCE, 15% off the control of minds. Thanks to the folks at Raycon. Or something like that. But yes, try Raycon. Yes. You'll be glad you did. Yes, you will. What are you doing, before we regret talking about AEW, what are you doing over on the 605 these days, this week? Another action-packed weekday on the Arcadia Month? Vanguard Podcast that was, Network. That was an unwieldily worded statement. What are you doing over there today, this week? So unwieldy, you thought I would have said it. But of course, check out information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. The latest episode of Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon is out right now at suawpod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcast. His latest guest, Howard Baum. Hear this show right now. People are raving about it. One of the funnier episodes. Check it out today. Once again, Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcast or suawpod.com. Also want to make mention this week on... Stick to wrestling with John McAdam. John's guest is Steve Crawford for a deep dive talk about Memphis wrestling, Lawler, Jimmy Hart, and so much more. Hear that today at McAdamPod.com or look for Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam wherever you find your favorite podcasts. You know, your programs are so demanding. Shut up and wrestle. Stick to wrestling. They're declarative statements. Well, we're the network with a little bit of an attitude, I guess you could say. But of course, the 605 Super Podcast, uh The Mothership! <laughs> hey! <laughs> Go through the archive today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Some interesting things happening at Arcadian Vanguard. Stay tuned. Next few weeks, some news and notes coming at you, but... The Mothership! 605pod.com. Oh, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Wonderful to be here. You've been a wonderful audience. All right, well, let's talk a little AEW. 
The time has come. There's nothing else left. This past Wednesday, June the 8th, was the first TV show that they've had to do where Punk's been injured. MJF is whatever's going on there is still on the outs. Who else? Danielson's off for a couple of weeks. We've heard Cole's off for a couple of weeks for whatever that's worth anymore. And we got to see what they had left over, pretty much. So, <laughs> God, it, you can tell when the top guys that take care and, and spend time and go into detail on their shit are not there and they're just left to the people who don't know or will do whatever Tony tells them because it's a massive difference and the way this thing was formatted. But the opening match was a 21-man casino battle royal where the guys would enter five at a time based on what suit of cards they were assigned at intermittent points in the night with the winner, uh, oh, and a joker then at the end. And boy, he did turn out to be a joker. With the winner facing Moxley later that night in that program, with the winner of that to then face the winner of Tanahashi and Goto at Forbidden Door to be the interim AEW champion to defend that title until Punk returns at a to-be-determined date. So easy to understand. And by the way, I thought Goto just died. Which Goto? Tarzan Goto just passed away. Different Goto. Different Goto. There's another Goto? There are multiple Gotos. There's not just Who one Who is Goto. this Goto? They just said Tanahashi and Goto. He's a younger wrestler than Tarzan Goto who wrestles for New Japan. Who you All may right, or may so. not see as the interim champion. It, I would hope sincerely we don't. I don't think there's any chance you will, but... But unfortunately, we now we know who it's going to be. It's going to be fucking Moxley again. So we got to put up with more garbage matches every week on television. The other way to look at it, though, is... Before they knew Punk was hurt, when he was doing the promo after the match, which happened after he got hurt, they teased Punk and Tanahashi, even though they teased it for Forbidden Door... If that was something Tony in his head really wanted, you could put the interim belt on Tanahashi, and then you still get that match. Because I think there is a problem. If they put it on Moxley, I I don't know. It doesn't feel like the time. Does Tanahashi live in Japan? I believe so, yes. Is he not one of New Japan's top guys? He is, absolutely, for the last what are, 15 years plus. What are the chances he's going to come back just every week? And how much would that cost? And who would give a shit? Interim champion. How many appearances does he have to make on TV? How long's Punk going to be out? We still don't even know that. Right. Surgery so, on his but, foot. What does that mean? Could be a bunion. Uh, it, well, as we've seen from those TV <laughs> commercials, <laughs> the bunion can be devastating. All right. Anyway, running through this battle royal real quick. The first five were... I started to say Kim Darby. <laughs> she was a perky little thing. Darby Allen, Tony Nese, who we've, I don't think we've ever actually seen him wrestle a singles match yet. He's just around sitting in the crowd a lot. Darby Allen, Tony Nese, Lance Archer, Eddie Kingston, and Daniel Garcia. Can't start one of these things without him. Kingston and Garcia had a fight while the other three stared at him. Darby jumped out to the floor and got his skateboard and started in the came in the ring with the skateboard and started just hitting Archer with it and then knocked him out of the ring and did a dive. So skate the battle royals are now no disqualification. You can bring in your skate. Why doesn't everybody then just bring in a goddamn sledgehammer? Or maybe an assault rifle? Those are easy to get. So within seconds of this thing starting, they're hitting each other with skateboards. Then Darby and Kingston had a slap fight while everybody else disappeared. You couldn't see anybody. Then they played music and here came more people. Ricky Starks, Jake Hager, Felix, Swerve, and Keith Lee. And that after pretty much no motion in the match for the first little bit, now they were 100 mile an hour doing things during everybody's entrances. Because... <laughs> 
as I said, when when everybody was already in the ring beforehand, it might be two guys and the other three have disappeared, or maybe they're just wandered around. But once people start coming into the ring, and you're paying trying to pay attention to the entrances, see who's coming in. That's when they kick it up two notches in the ring, and they're going 100 miles an hour. So in the ring, it's a mess. Um, Darby Allen at one point dropped Daniel Garcia on his head. Felix is the shits. He can spring up to the ropes and jump off the ropes and turn around, jump down, pick a bale of cotton. As long as he's flipping around in the air and anything else he tries to do looks like shit and the timing is off. He can do his gymnastics. Now all the entrances are over with. Everybody's got in the ring and everything came to a halt again. And then they picked, it looked like a drunken bum fight at one point. Keith Lee went to run, niece is on the apron. Keith Lee ran to run behind him and, and do the pre-planned spot where he knocks him off the apron. But <laughs> niece wasn't look, not only wasn't looking for Keith Lee, but walked down the apron and turned his back on him. So Keith Lee had to run up. Did you see this part? He ran up and went to hit niece from behind and realized that he wasn't looking and he would kill him. So he just stopped. And then he grabbed him and turned him around and just clubbered him. And then they got reconnected somehow. And Nice gets back up on the apron. And then Keith Lee just looks at him and pushes him off. L.A. Uh, L.A. Who is L.A. here? Who's LA? Lance Archer. Oh. Lance Archer. See, I'm trying to abbreviate. Lance Archer and Keith Lee went to do a big spot. And right as it paid off, they were about to go over the top rope. The camera cut away. So one of the announcers called, well, Lance Archer's been eliminated, or Keith Lee's been eliminated, but he wasn't really. He rolled back in and dumped Lance Archer over the top. And then more music played, and here came five more guys, plus hangers on. Little Brutus, take a shit still there. And then here came Max Caster in the gun club with Bowens in the wheelchair being wheeled by Billy. And again, little Brutus gets in the ring and starts doing shit. Take a shit, gets in the ring and starts doing shit. But they know that Caster's got a rap. So now they've got Caster on the ramp rapping while they're going 100 miles an hour in the ring, but nobody's paying any attention to that because they're listening to the rap. It's so distracting. Did you enjoy the rap, Brian? I always enjoy Max Caster. He's creative. He's funny. They got a whole thing going on with the Gun Club, who now have a new nickname <laughs> that everyone's just accepted. I get a kick out of it, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I did, because sometimes we don't give Caster his due. So what I did was I transcribed the rap. Would you like to hear me read the rap? You transcribed it, really? I transcribed the rap, and now I've been reading the rap. And if you've read the rap that he's written, you'll know it's a really well-written rap. So he said, and I quote, Listen, yo, acclaimed in the guns, yo, we, we back in the zone. All y'all gonna choke like Patrick Mahone. Yo, Felix, I don't give one look. I'll break your arm again like I broke Punk's foot. Hager, Garcia, y'all out of luck. I'ma send you back up Jericho's butt. <laughs> I'm turning all y'all into sad boys. Two guns that shouldn't be banned are the ass boys. Yo. Rather tame. He, did, he didn't get anybody's vagina or anything on this one, but we'll try to keep a, a running uh, account of these as we go forward. I'll, I'll, I like being a rapper. It's fun to be musical. I like that you were, in, you were trying to, I guess, be musical, but whatever that tone was that you had there. Well, that's what he said. You're trying to match a beat? What were you doing? <laughs> yeah, you got you to have, you got to feel the, you got to have the soul in your stroll and feel the beat in your feet. That's what you got to do. Well, you're making my liver quiver. What else was on this uh, battle royal? Here? Well, as long as your spleen won't turn green. So Bowens did his deal where he screams and yells. And through this whole thing, they've still been fighting in the ring and nobody's paying any attention to anything else. And then they go to the break. And when they come back from the break, it's time for the music to play again. So as a match, this was a complete clusterfuck with just people doing shit at random. 
But here comes Hobbs, Fish, and Kyle O'Reilly. And before the other two guys can even come out, Darby Allen has already given O'Reilly and Fish a coffin drop off the top turnbuckle to the floor before they even got in the ring. And then here comes Dante Martin and Wheeler Useless. Now it's full scrambled eggs. I mean, it's the moons over Miami here. Almost none of these guys know what they're doing in a battle royal. They're taking bumps. They're doing shit that if you fell on somebody's leg behind you, whatever, you kill them. Keith Lee eliminated both the guns. The guns again stood out. They did a fucking choreographed simultaneous bump sell into the ropes and get clotheslined over the top. They were feeding like a goddamn zookeeper. I mean, they're great anytime they know anybody's got their eyes on them. But then, Swerve, Swerve has been partners with Keith Lee and friends with Keith Lee, and they've been together against the other people that they were together against, right? That is correct. Well, Swerve dumped Keith Lee and then laughed at him about it. And Keith Lee's down on the floor mad, so now Swerve has has switched heel No, on Keith Lee. Not necessarily. He's true to his name. What's his name? Swerve. Well, I, It was a Swerve. Do you think that's his given Christian name? Is that on his birth certificate? Anyway, so now Swerve turned heel on Keith Lee after they've been together for three weeks. Um, and then the Joker music plays, and guess who the Joker is? Andre Oliolio in his baseball pants. Why has he raided Abe Knuckleball Schwartz's locker for his ring gear? Um, and then I, I wrote, does anybody buy that a third of these guys should be competing in any way for the for the world championship? And Hobbs and Starks dumped Take a Shit, and Felix dumped Starks. Everybody did everything at 100 miles an hour. A Swerve then dumped Darby. So now Swerve is a full-fledged heel because he dumped Darby and got booed for it because they didn't like that. And then Andre, Ole Ole, the heel, dumps Swerve and the people cheer him. <laughs> and then Hobbs, the beast, Hobbs does a great spine buster on Felix and goes to dump him over and Wheeler useless comes from behind and just dumps Hobbs like a sack of shit. I'm it, who's well, got what do you have against is, what do you have against Yuda? You keep calling him useless. He's pretty good, Yuda. Because seriously, you may not like how he's being pushed, but he's not bad. Between him and Garcia, who have they got the pictures of? Garcia I has mean, the pictures. they had every well, Yuda's got something. Yuda's got some kind of goddamn evidence on somebody from every top star in the company doing everything they can to get Yuda over. I'm sorry. I'm sure he's a nice young man. He's very athletic. He's got the charisma of fucking cabbage. He's bland and thin. And they've got people running around in the company already that with that level of push would be amazing. But because some, I guess he does a good imitation of a Japanese wrestler, he's got to get pushed instead of the fucking money potential here. So he dumps Hobbs, which is like trading your house for a tent, as a wise man once said. So the last four were Yuta, Andre, O'Reilly, and Felix. They had a chance. Can I just say? It was yes. at this point that I realized I'm going to hate the interim championship. Yes. I'm going to hate how it's booked, despite liking O'Reilly in general. Whatever they're going to do here, it's not the way I think they should go. Or Could you have elevated Hobbs, of course? Could you have elevated Starks, of course? Could you have done something with fucking, obviously, O'Reilly, which they did only so he could get beat? Could you, is there anybody else in this thing that's worth a shit? Eddie Kingston, that horse may have left the barn because he's just doing everything with everybody now, but my God. So the point is, at that point, there's four guys left. Yuta, Andre, O'Reilly, Felix. Yuta and O'Reilly did a bunch of shit to each other, but they would not sell anything, and then suddenly they just both start selling, even though one guy just clotheslined the shit out of the other guy, and they'd both be down. But otherwise, they'd pop right up. 
Felix and Andre did gymnastics, and Andre hit him with a nut shot and tossed him. That's where I'm saying, please don't let Wheeler win. And then Andre got dumped. O'Reilly and Ute on the apron. O'Reilly knocked him off, and he wins the match, so he goes to face John Moxley. And that would have been great, except I knew Moxley was going to win, and that doomed the whole fucking thing. And that was the first 25 minutes of this program was this fucking car wreck battle royal. If Yuta had won, the finish of Yuta and Moxley would have been a little more in question than it was with Moxley versus O'Reilly, which I agree. Anyone who saw this knew right away Moxley was going to win. The baby face who's rested is going to beat the heel who just won a battle royal. Well, besides that, if it had been Yuta, it would have been in question because everybody has said, you know what? They're fucking stupid enough to put this guy right? over Moxley. <laughs> right. And they've been pushing him with Moxley as part of that group. They could do something there, but. But it still would have been ridiculous. But at least we wouldn't have had to have Kyle O'Reilly, poor fella, do another job at the hands of the king of the garbage match. Get him away from everyone. Kyle O'Reilly needs to be away from any faction of any sort. Even give him new trunks, just mix something new with him, because he's so good and it just feels like he's kind of being held, there's like a chain around him, and he's being held in place. And I think he just needs to like not have like, I hate to say it, I think yeah. he needs to be away from Fish, and I think he needs to be away from Cole, and they kind of need to do something completely different with him now. Well, Moxley followed this up backstage with another promo where he's really pissed off, but you have no idea about what because he never really gets a a point out. He just says New Japan a lot and eh, whatever. Did you understand what he said there? He is like a modern day at times Thunderbolt Patterson. It's like he knows (laughs) he has to fill up 30 seconds and he's going to find a way to do it without saying anything. And he sounds like he means it, but you don't have a goddamn idea what he's talking about. I don't know. All right. Did you... (laughs) They've just finished having a battle royal to determine the interim AEW champion. And they're going to have a match later on to help determine that, but that's not even going to be settled until the pay-per-view coming up in a couple of weeks. And now they make the announcement of a new championship coming to AEW. Did you hear the voiceover when they said, from the visionary Tony Khan? (laughs) It almost seemed like it was a spoof because of that. It was a, it, you could tell in the tone of the reading that they couldn't believe they were actually being expected. Was it Shivani? I think that's, that did it. But it was uh, the visionary Tony Khan presents the all Atlantic title. And of course, how will the champion be crowned in a tournament? When will it begin? Tonight! <laughs> when will it end? <laughs> Never! Right now! The first time we hear about this new championship, they don't even have a fucking AEW champion now. They're still trying to name him. And the first time we hear about the All-Atlantic Championship, the champion who will be crowned in a tournament, it will begin right fucking now. And if they showed the brackets... It's Buddy Matthews and Pac and The Other Page and Miro and Penthouse and Malachi Black and two guys unnamed from New Japan Pro Wrestling and the winners of the four elimination matches will meet in a four-way, of course, at Behind the Green Door pay-per-view on June 26th. Now, hold on one second. Go through the bracket again. This is the All-Atlantic championship who was in it buddy matthews where's Pac. he from Where, well, hold on buddy matthews is from is it australia or new zealand one of those okay not the atlantic ocean or anywhere near it well we're getting there pack pack well he he's is from england yeah. he's covered the other page he's canadian i believe so you right. got one side or the other miro i'm not sure where bulgaria is i don't think it's on the atlantic penthouse there's there's Mexico. some Atlantic over there. Yeah. Malachi Black and the two new New Japan guys. That's where I wasn't sure about Buddy Matthews. I didn't really think about him. 
But isn't Japan in the Pacific? But the point of the All-Atlantic title, they're not All-Atlantic. It should be the Sum Atlantic title. But anyway, they go immediately into the first tournament match 15 seconds after the announcement of the tournament was over with. And it's Buddy versus Pac. And uh, the good thing was a sign in the crowd that said, Free MJF. But here's the deal. I'm finally seeing Buddy for the first time in a match instead of the Gaga of a singles match, focus on him. He's in shape. He's athletic. They did some nice mat wrestling. Buddy Matthews has a horrible name and he's in a horrible group, but there might be something there except remember we've talked about Pac. He looks good too. He's built like crazy. He's athletic. He looks like a badass. As long as they were doing the mat wrestling and the British stuff, they were fine. You know, takeovers and leapfrogs and drop downs. Then they did a some kind of goofy slide in and out spot, which they went to the break on. One guy slid out on the floor. The other guy was going to fucking come after him, but that guy dives back in the ring when that guy's on the floor. And then they switch places again. And then they both slid out and looked at each other. And then they go to the break. As soon as they go to the break, Pac in commercial now, in picture in picture, Pac throws Buddy all the way across and through the announcer's table out on the floor. They couldn't actually put that on TV. If you hung with picture in picture, you saw it. Otherwise, all you saw was them fucking sliding in and out. Something always happens at some point in Pax matches where they fall apart and make no fucking sense. And then they came back from the break and they, you know, they, they trade the forearms and kicks where nobody sells until they both sell. And then Buddy did a sunset flip roll through power bomb. That was nice. Got a two count. Then everything came to a halt again for a few seconds. And then Buddy went into the corner and bent over and stood in a position for Pac to hop up and give him a reverse Hurricane Rana that almost broke both of their fucking necks. And then Pac hit a kick and a flip off the top rope, one, two, three. So Pac advances in the All-Atlantic Tournament. What do you think of this? It was all right for what it was, but, you know, this was... One of the worst episodes of Dynamite I've ever seen. And this match was just in the middle of it. And nothing on this show was really good. It's, it really stands out. You know, a lot of people pointed out how they thought things changed after Cody was actively involved. That they saw a noticeable change in various segments. Like you said at the top, this is without CM Punk and without MJF. And this show was a mess in my eyes. Announcing this title all of a sudden. They said we're gonna have a new title. I'm like, oh, here we go, the trio's championship. No! A unnecessary title no one thought of. <laughs> the All Wait Atlantic Championship. Well, I just I wrote it down here because and Paige later on will get to it. He's bitching and whining about challenging for the IWGP title. Cause he said he actually said on their TV show, well, you know, there's more than one world championship in wrestling. So I'm I'm not going to get a shot at the AEW title so I'll I'll get one at the at the New Japan so they've got the AEW champion the interim AEW champion the All Atlantic champion the Ring of Honor champion the New Japan Pro Wrestling champion the TNT champion the TBS champion the FTW champion the ROH TV champion the Owen Hart tournament champion male and female with belts. And I'm not even getting into tag teams. Trent was in the ring for a live promo. And like every gripping orator, he opened the promo with this phrase, guys, I'm kind of bummed out. <laughs> His best friends aren't there. I think, have they gotten rid of pockets finally? No, he's Have we seen the... He's injured. He, I guarantee you they're going to try to surprise people and all of a sudden that music's going to hit and he's going to slowly walk out. 
He's coming back. I don't think he's gone. I don't know. Dwarf Dong Sucker just disappeared. Jelly Nutella just disappeared. All the dreck has just kind of disappeared. They never moved the ratings, and Tony Khan never dressed like any of them for Halloween. <laughs> Pockets ain't going anywhere. Mark my words. <sighs> well, they wasn't there tonight. Old Chucklefuck, Muffin Top Taylor, and Pockets weren't there. So he now, starts... But, but let me stop you. You asked about Pockets. You didn't ask about Chuck Taylor. To me, that's the more interesting one, because now... Well, we've there seen, you go. We've seen Trent a few times with Rocky Romero. They used to be a tag team in New Japan. They've been teaming up again, and now there's a New Japan AEW connection. He's all of a sudden teaming with FTR. He's all of a sudden doing bad promos on his own in the middle of the <laughs> ring. Now, he still has the best friend's music. But you got to think, whoever Tony listens to who doesn't kiss his ass and tell him this stuff's all great has to be telling him, you know, that Chuck Taylor, if only Trent didn't have that hanging around yeah. his neck. So who knows? Well, because he mentioned Rapongi Vice. But, you know, that's the thing. Again, Trent says Rapongi Vice deserves one more shot at FTR and those tag team titles that they hold from another company that doesn't exist anymore. And... That's great if you know who Rapongi Vice is, but Rapongi Vice has only been on the show, what, twice or three times? He could have said, me and Rocky, I, whatever. It is, it's, it's the same thing as Ring of Honor in 2007. It's a private club. They don't want anybody to understand because all of the nerd marks don't want normal fans coming in, screwing their shit up by expecting it to make sense. Anyway, so he calls FTR out. Their music, here they come. Jim Ross says, arguably the best tag team in the world, Excalibur. Reedy, Reedy. He can't even do his job to say, well, yes, you're right, JR, because he knows that the fucking smarmy little fucking kookamonga kids that got him the job that he don't deserve will be mad if he agrees with Jim Ross at FTR, are the, arguably the best tag team in the world. So then JR says, well, I know you're a fan of the Young Bucks. And old Sockface goes, well, he's Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus as well. So he, he's a fan of all of the tag teams as long as they're the Young Bucks or friends of the Young Bucks. That was quite telling that that got on the air. I mean, obviously it's a live show, but Jim Ross making that statement, which is a pretty benign statement because how can anyone argue they are? Even if you're a fan of the Young Bucks, they're one of the best tag teams in the world. And when he threw it yeah. in Excalibur, he froze. <laughs> how about that? It was like Ivanka tried to tell the truth on her fucking daddy. Under oath. Humana, humana, humana. Anyway, so FTR did a good promo and basically said that Trent should be mad at Will Osprey's bitch boys. Because I guess they're the ones that jumped in the other night or whatever the fuck. Has Will Osprey's name ever been mentioned on this TV show before last week? Or was it, he wasn't even there last week, was he? Or did he jump in or was he just with the other? Who the, what the fuck? The point is, we've never seen this fucking guy or heard of him. He's never wrestled this fucking United States of America until either the previous show, his name was mentioned, he ran out, whatever. And now, Will Osprey's bitch boys, like everybody knows who all these people are. And so, of course, as soon as they say that, music plays and out comes Will Ostrich. The leader of the United Empire, we are told by the announcers. Has that name ever been mentioned on this TV show before? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I've only seen one clip of Will Ostrich. I'll call him Osprey. I just like Ostrich. You know, the meat in the Ostrich meat uh, has more fat, but it's less filling. Do you like Ostrich burgers? I've never had one, and I don't intend to try. I'm just kidding. Fuddruckers, they have them. Well, I haven't been to a Fuddruckers in ages. They kind of, they hit their peak, and they went downhill. Remember the name of their sauce? I do not. Mother Fuddrucker. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. well, nevertheless. Anyway, I've seen one clip of Will Osprey, and it was several years ago when, again... And this was before he completely lost his mind and before that I had ascertained that he'd lost part of it. Uncle Dave was saying that Will Osprey was the greatest wrestler in the world. So 
there's a clip on Twitter or on the internet or whatever, a Will Osprey, it's labeled. I said, well, I got to see this guy, right? And it was him and somebody else. And like I said, this was several years ago. He was quite thinner then, smaller, lighter. But they went through about a 90-second to two-minute routine, choreographed, oh. gymnastic, you know. It was Ricochet. Ricochet. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> Even better. So you know how bad one is by themselves. So when they get both in together, it was so far off the charts as being ridiculous that I started laughing. And I said, what the fuck? I mean, I would have voted for him on America's Got Talent. It was amazing. They nailed every flip and every stuck every landing, and they helped boost each other up, and they turned in the air perfectly. It was a wonderful choreographed, planned routine of gymnastics. There, It bore no resemblance to pro wrestling or any type of conflict or contest. And so... Like I said, if they were on AGT, I would have voted them through to the next round, but it was a fucking, it was a joke as a wrestling match. And that's all I've ever seen of this guy. And I continue to hear Uncle Dave say, of course, then Twinkle Toes took over in, in his mind and heart. And that's, you know, Ostrich became kind of the spurned paramour on the outside of the, the love triangle. But I figure, okay, if they show me this guy, I will watch him and see what all the shouting's about. Well, he comes out on the ramp, and he says a couple of words, and suddenly in the ring from behind comes people that were identified as Aaron Hanori and Ozzy Oldham. And they jump... FTR and Trent and every single one of the guys that jumped in were dressed in black street clothes so you couldn't tell them apart and they had a sloppy fight and then I realized now there's three or four guys in the ring then they mentioned Kyle Fletcher and Mark Davis are two of the guys in the black but I couldn't find Ozzy Oldham and then later on I don't know if it's in this program or actually it may have been on Rampage I realized that Ozzy Oldham is Aussie Open. And that's the tag team name of Kyle Fletcher and Mark Davis. And the only Mark Davis I've ever heard of in my life was the fucking video editor and the technical guy for Ring of Honor. And he was a hell of a guy. But he didn't look like this guy. So then FTR suddenly disappeared from the ring. They were in the ring when they got jumped. But then when when these guys, they beat up Trent and FTR was gone. So they left Trent without helping him? <laughs> or they were carried out on a stretcher and we missed it? I don't know what the fuck. But the again, a bunch of people that nobody knows, nobody's ever heard their names. You couldn't pick them out of a lineup and they've had no buildup. And suddenly they're beating people up that have never teamed before and just it's like we're watching a new program that we've never watched before and we don't know what's going on because we don't know who these people are and then random people show up if you're a casual viewer or someone who doesn't keep up with new japan or anything else and excalibur tries to get out everything as quick as he can no that's us and you don't even know who he's naming you don't know what he's talking about you know, people have accused me of being a fast talker, but did you understand the things that I was saying because of the inflection and or the pause every once in a while in my comments? It's that, and it was also that you weren't shooting out names that we've never heard before on TV. <laughs> because when you shoot out a bunch of names real quick, you don't even know if they're names. You can't figure out what he's saying. They got to stop assuming everyone knows what the fuck's going on. Because even most of the people on this program don't know what the fuck is going on. All right, one thing redeemed this program for me. I got to see David Finley. The next match was Adam Page and David Finley, and that's Fitz's son. Obviously, I would think most people would know that because of his tenure in the wrestling business. And facially, I see it in this kid, too. He looks 
facially just like fit. Uh, but another new face out of nowhere, again, with no build, no advance notice he was coming, but I'll take this one because this kid knows what the fuck he's doing. Lockups, a great drop kick. He's in shape. He looks serious. He's got better basics and fundamentals than fucking Page. Matter of fact, I was looking for mistakes. Page was the only one I thought that made any. And it was a clear baby face and heel dynamic, so everybody could understand what was going on. The only thing I didn't like, and this is epidemic on these programs, and you would think that the heels would figure it out and restructure their match. But in a lot of cases, have you noticed the baby faces will shine, the heels will take all their bumps and shine them up like a brand new penny, and then the heels will take over, stop them with a heat spot, get the heat, they'll go to break. Then all the heels heats in the break. And when they come back, within seconds, the baby face is making his comeback. Now, on taped programs, especially when they had to edit for time, that used to be a thing they would do because the editors considered all the baby face shine more exciting than the heel heat. And we would watch our matches back on television and get pissed. They cut our fucking heat out. I mean, that was shit you went and complained about. You cut three minutes of my fucking heat out of this goddamn match. It looks like that all they did was kick the shit out of us. That ain't going to fly. But now it's what they do every fucking show. Heat starts, they go to the break, they come back, the baby face make it a comeback. These are the most ineffective, impotent heels I've ever seen in my life. So they come back from the break. Finley was getting the heat. Paige immediately makes a comeback. But Finley, good bumps, good body language. This is a guy they ought to sign. And, but again, even though I like Finley better than I like Paige in this context, the former champion that just lost in the highest profile match of his career against CM Punk is being taken to the limit by somebody that nobody that watches this television program has ever heard of before because he's never been here, never been mentioned. But, it, you know, in this case, hey, let's get Finley over. I've given up on Paige. Uh, what a great over-the-knee backbreaker by Finley. Kicked more shit out of Paige, and finally Paige hit the clothesline and the buckshot one, two, three. But I'm a fan of David Finley's. I could see more of him. Could you see any more of him? Yeah, it was a good match. The problem is, you know, it's hard to get invested in some of these guys when I don't think we're going to see more of them. Some of these New Japan guys, they just drop in. Oh, yeah, we'll probably never see them again. Remember they made a big deal out of Jay Slingblade White? And I was like, all right, (laughs) let's give him a chance. And he had one match, and we haven't seen him on TV again. So, you know, we'll see. It's all right. Again, I think this was just overall bad show, and at times a dry show. And it just felt like there was no energy, uh, for me at least. That's well, what I felt. Now, now, wait a minute. The dryness is coming up because Paige is going to speak. Well, that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. He did the in-ring promo. And there was a lot that he wanted to say about the AEW world title, but tonight's not the night. It sounded like little bitch boy here is not happy that he lost the belt and then the guy that won it from him got hurt. It sounds like he was having a little tantrum because he, he mentioned, well, I wasn't in the battle royal for it. That's, again, are they switching him into a whiny, bitchy heel because that's the way he comes off, or is he just coming off that way and there's nothing they can do about it? But did you pick up on the little comments about the, I won't talk about the title tonight, and I went in the Battle Royal, I guess I'm not going to get another title shot at the AEW title, but there's more than one world championship in wrestling. Sure, there's 15 of them in this company alone. Yeah, I think you're looking at the next Ring of Honor world champion right there. (laughs) He's going to do to Adam Page what he did to FTR. Well, he challenged for the IWGP title at Forbidden Door against Okada, I believe. And then Adam Cole comes out and says, well, my friend Jay White may be the champion instead of Okada. But I should get uh, uh, more people that would like, and and my brother-in-law, Ken, he'll be there too. The guy in fucking Denver doesn't know who Ken is either. 
But Cole wants the New Japan title shot, so they're going to go round and round about that. Tony Schiavone was live in the ring with Wardlow. I'm going to get to the meat of the rest of this matter fairly quickly. Wardlow looks great in street clothes. They told Wardlow to say that he refused to be in the Battle Royal, and he revealed the reason because, and by the way, when Wardlow starts talking, he takes the microphone and Shivani just vaporizes. You never see him again. The comment to the announcer, the interviewer, he just takes off. But they actually had Wardlow say he didn't get in the Battle Royal because if he can't beat the real champion, CM Punk, for the AEW title, he doesn't want it yet. Even though if he won the interim title, it would guarantee him the very first match with Punk when Punk comes back. But that's a logical loophole that evades all of them because they just told him to say that he refused to be in the battle royal for that reason, not thinking that anybody would think it through because they didn't want to put Wardlow over in that battle royal because then they'd have had to have Wardlow and Moxley. Tell me how that one was going to come out. They kept Paige out of the battle royal. They kept, well, Cole's injured. They kept Wardlow out of the battle royal. It's interesting the people they kept out of the battle royal. Anybody that you would think might be able to win it. So, <sighs> he's lost his chance now to actually earn the chance to face Punk, but the title that he does want is the TNT title. And I'm, if they keep giving Wardlow convoluted shit that's either hard to explain or hard for the people to understand or hard for him to fucking explain because he doesn't understand it himself, they're going to bury him. And again, I worry because he's not got an MJF to be his antagonist. And <laughs> the reason I have much worry is because as soon as Wardlow mentions the TNT title, then there's Scorpio Sky on the other page and Dan Lambert instantly out, but nothing happens. But they go then to Mark Sterling, the fake lawyer, in a black neck brace to match his suit, and security guards standing there. Remember, he's filed a fake class action suit because he's a fake lawyer for fake offenses that were done against the fake security guards that everybody knows is fake. And when Wardlow was beating him up and power bombing him and throwing him around like sacks of shit, that was entertaining because we don't give a fuck about those people. And we wanted to see Wardlow do that. But now that Sterling, who everybody knows is fake, and these miscellaneous fake security guards are filing a fake lawsuit against Wardlow and they're going to give this TV time, Wardlow better have a fucking fallback career. And what was said was that either Mark Sterling says you can either face me in court or you can wrestle 20 security guards next week on television. Can you imagine the hot garbage that this is going to be when, again, running in the cage one at a time so they can get wiped out, whatever, that's fine. But actually, the promotion sanctioning or Wardlow agreeing to, or anybody even given a passing thought to that. And well, instead of this lawsuit you're threatening me with, I'll just fight those 20 guys in a, in a match on TV. Fuck you. Whatever fucking drugs Tony is on to take care of whatever thing he's got going on, he needs to either take some more or back off of them. One or the other. Then the hardly but what do you do you want to see Wardlow versus 20 security guards Brian the biggest fear we had was and we said it for weeks what are they going to do with Wardlow after MJF and it has so far been incredibly underwhelming he's starting to feel just like everyone else mixing with everyone else in stupid ways. I mean, the Sterling thing, like you said, it's taking Wardlow to a goofy level he doesn't need to be. And now we're going to get to just watch him kill 20 guys. I'm sure it's a great idea in Tony's head. We'll see how it comes across on TV. I do think they should have him just destroy Scorpio Sky and get that belt on him. And just have him destroy people week after week until there's someone yeah. that's a good opponent that finally either shows up or gets a push like a Hobbs or someone else. The Hippocratic Oath of Wrestling. First, do no harm. People are liking something, just give them some more of that until you've got a, a good option. But 
And again, Wardlow, it's not Wardlow's fault. He's got that great look. He looks great in street clothes. He looks great in his tights. He looks like a star. He can move. He's got the size, the athleticism. He doesn't have the experience. He doesn't know how to take care of himself. He needs a strong booker and veteran talent around him. But he don't have either one of those. The way he's got some veteran talent sometimes, but he's not interacting with any of them here with Mark Sterling and 20 security guards. Just think about this. Look at Wardlow. Look the way he looks when they got him, right? And the things he can do when they got him. And two years later, thanks to basically MJF and the heat he got and then the fucking promos he was able to do and the way they were able to paint Wardlow as the indentured servant, et cetera, et cetera. People are loving him, but he still needs guidance and he needs the proper fucking... <laughs> the, the, take him by the hand and lead him through all this and and teach him how to get himself over. And one more I thing. Go ahead. No more promos. I'm sorry. Keep him off the mic. It's not doing him any favors. Like I said, when he has to explain shit or recount reasoning that they come up with it needs to be kill crush destroy and a man a few words but i remind everybody that dusty Rhodes, a strong booker who knew what he was doing and had all kinds of experience and had worked under the best took a fat fucking job guy that had six matches named ray trailer and in less than a year gave him a gimmick and a push and used his natural talent and had veterans around him teach him how to get himself over. And within, like I said, less than a year, Dusty Rhodes versus Big Bubba Rogers drew 16,000 people as a main event in Pittsburgh. Still to this day, the all-time Pittsburgh wrestling crowd record. And I loved Bubba to death, but he didn't look anything near Wardlow when he first showed up at Atlanta TV. He looked like a fat guy working at a car wash, but he had talent. And Dusty gave him something to accentuate the talent, take advantage of the positives, magnify the strong spots, negate or hide the weak spots, and drew a ton of fucking money with him. And within a year after that, he was so good and so over that Vince hired him to fucking be Hulk Hogan's hand-picked opponent. Wardlow's wrestling 20 fake security guards under threat of a fake civil suit. Okay. So the Hardly boys did a pre-tape in the back. They won a tag team title shot, but the Hardy boys came in and they need a tag team title shot. And then here came Christian Cage and Jungle Boy and Dino Douche, and they made the challenge for a tag team title three-way ladder match next week on tv oh fucking god at least that's something we can skip but a ladder match a triple threat ladder match between spot monkey central the cucamonga kids jungle boy and dino douche and dino's gonna try to do all the flipping he can do so that'll be goddamn uglier than a fucking brown-eyed fucking mud fence and matt and jeff in a ladder match how much brain damage do they need to give the hardy family in this company matt's had three concussions that we saw on live television jeff hardy is, is was a near hospital case the other day and that's something i heard uncle dave just blistering the WWE and the doctors for letting Cody work with a torn peck. He had probably one of the worst bruises because of the internal bleeding that goes on when you tear a muscle or a tendon. Horrible bruise, ugly bruise. That's a painful fucking injury. But there is no way working with a torn peck can give you brain damage. But Uncle Dave was on the goddamn white horse and wearing his shining armor about letting Cody work one of the better WWE matches of the year while injured with a torn peck. But Jeff Hardy, 
who almost killed himself a couple weeks ago in that thing with Darby, Matt Hardy, who actually was brain damaged in front of us on several occasions on their television. The guy cross-bodied his face, guy threw the chair in his fucking head. The guy knocked him off the goddamn forklift, and he did the WRAF deal, walking recklessly and attempting to fall. Couldn't get his fucking legs underneath him. They should have stopped the match. They did stop the match and then started it again. Jeff Hardy didn't remember the match he just had with the Hardly Boys. So are, do we have a double standard here? A guy gutted through a great match of main event of a pay-per-view with one arm because he tore his pec or a guy doing garbage fucking matches, not even in a ring, in AEW, getting brain damage and being allowed to go on. Which is worse? You know, the Jeff Hardy story I heard the other day about the idea that he got knocked out early in the Young Bucks match at the pay-per-view and has no memory of the match whatsoever and just went through the match with whatever instincts he has. Thinking, all right, I guess he'd be on the injured list. They'll keep him off TV and keep him out of the ring for a while. And then they announce this. I'm convinced Tony Khan signed the Hardys to kill them. <laughs> They've obviously done something to hurt him or his family. And he's going to kill them. And it'll be in his ring. That's the only thing I could think of. Uh, so the WWE's concussion protocol is doctors and analytical tests and waiting periods and blah, blah. The, the AEW concussion protocol is how many fingers am I holding up? Two? Close enough. It was three. <sighs> anyway. And I'm still, and, and by the way, on the Cody thing, I'm still kind of uncomfortable with Cody working that match. I mean, I know it all worked out. He got the surgery, and hopefully in the Royal Rumble, he looks great. But it was hard to watch that match because of the swelling, because of the discoloration. So I'm not defending that either when I say it. But you know what? Here's the thing. <sighs> This was kind of a flashback. You felt your stomach was queasy watching it because of the nature of the injury and the visual nature of it. And you also knew it had to hurt like shit and you were worried and concerned about him. And is he going to hurt himself worse, right? And boy, now imagine the only thing different is you don't know it's a work. And you think the other guy is trying to hurt that injury even worse. How worried would you have been? I would have been ready to climb the cage with a chair in my hand. There you go. That's exactly the way that the people in the buildings felt about every top babyface in the history of wrestling in the territory days. They were worried about him because if he wasn't going into the match with an injury, then he started selling one in the match. That's the way that the heel would get heat. And the feeling that everybody had is I've witnessed it. I had it when I was young enough. And then I've witnessed it in a lot of other people, the feeling that everybody had watching Cody wrestle, knowing he was legitimately injured. And there was a chance that he was going to fuck himself up. Even though the only way he really could have fucked himself up any worse was if he hurt something else compensating for you couldn't, you can't, as we mentioned, tear a tendon or a muscle twice. It's gone. It's gone. But the people were worried about the baby face, physically worried about his safety and welfare. That's the feeling they had in main event matches, and though not just once in a great blue moon, but every week. We're worried about this guy. He's going to get hurt unless he beats this fucking whoever and wins the title back and gets even for what happened to him. That was why they were on the edge of their seat. That was why they were trying to climb in the ring and help. The only difference is what we were looking at with Cody is those people didn't know it was a work and thought the opponent was going to, instead of trying to help him get through it, thought he was going to make it worse. But anyway, so I'm, I wasn't... If you're a fan of the Hardys, do you want to see them anymore? I mean, I'm not even talking no. about like... Yeah, I mean, I'm not even talking about creatively, just in terms of their health. Do you want to see them anymore? And that's it. And in 1990, when did Dude Love start? 1997 or eight? Was it, it was seven? Seven, I believe. Okay, 25 years ago. How old was Mick Foley? He was still in his 30s, right? 
And that's when I told him because he came to me and he said he didn't like he loved the dude love concept because that was his thing he invented when he was a kid. And he never thought he'd actually get to do it for real in wrestling. And then, of course, he realized that he'd never really done it for real and never on TV. And he didn't really know who dude love was. But dude love, he felt was shortchanging the fans because dude love wasn't doing the high risk shit and taking the big bumps. He was the. The fucking, hey, Valiant Brothers, woo, mercy guy, and the strutting kind of ladies' man guy, and the peace tie-dye kind of guy. He wasn't getting bashed with chairs over his head or falling off cells or going through tables. And he felt like he was shortchanging the people. And I said, I said, Cactus, I said, the thing is, you have a very special talent and or position with these people they have come to like you they don't like your gimmick they like you as a person they can you shine through whether it's cactus jack or mankind or now dude love i said and the the hell in a cell was just the previous year right no <clears throat> that would be when he came back he took the bump the cell was 98 so he'd been doing the other right I believe I get so, my, yeah. So the point is, he'd been doing Mankind, doing all that shit. Remember the bump he took against Michaels where he got drop-kicked off the ring apron September of 96 in Philly and went head-first through the table. Table didn't break in half, he went head-first through it. A hole came in it. He'd been doing all that crazy shit, but Dude Love didn't. And I said, they, the fans have come to like you and to care about you, and they're not enjoying anymore seeing you hurt yourself or do things that are going to damage you they want to be entertained by you now but sometimes you go say they want wrestling and they want action and excitement but sometimes you go too far you go so far they feel uncomfortable they don't want you to be hurt and so they don't feel like dude love is shortchanging them because you're giving them a different part of you and let your body rest up. So he did that for six months or whatever. And then the next summer he took the fucking bump off the cage, but you know, he couldn't stay away from it, but, but that's the thing is it, it's just, it's a completely different mindset from the fans and the wrestlers where he, you know, Cody, he knew cause you could tell from the way he was selling that from the beginning that was a Dusty Rhodes special. He's got the people's sympathy. Not in a working way, but in a shooting way. They know he's hurt. He's going to milk that cow for all the fucking juice she's going to give. And it was great. Because they were worried about him. And that's a feeling that nobody has for the baby faces anymore. Nobody's worried enough to care about their well-being and want to help them if necessary. So anyway. Back to this rotten fucking program after we've had that editorial announcement. The women's title was on the line. And we see we've still got women's tag team champions and six women champions to go. So we got a bunch more belts. I'm glad he made a, bu a bunch of them. Thunder Rosa versus Marina Schaefer. Tell me, Brian, is Marina Schaefer not the one that Shafir, is Shafir. Her last name is Shafir. Okay, well, whichever one she is. Is she not the one that's married to Roderick Strong? She is. Do they never speak? They never wrestle in a ring together, if that's what you're asking. You would have to have thought that Roddy, I mean, Roderick Strong, in ring is one of the all-around best, most polished talents. He can do anything. And, and go, his cardio, everything. I can't believe he's not seen his wife is challenged at best description in this industry and is certainly he's given her some one-on-one -on -one instruction and then the case becomes if you've not only been through a wrestling training school of some description but you're living with Roderick Strong and have the ability for him to show you what to do and you're still not any better than this should you give up that is the question who's who do you blame for that Boston Crab what no it, it, all of this was marina and it, because 
even if you're trying to feed somebody your legs or your arms or something so they can get a hold on you, when when you don't know what they're doing, you, you don't really know which way to turn, and then they drop what they've got of yours. They drop it because you turned the wrong way because you don't know where you're fucking going. I mean, she fucked up a snap mare. There was no, she grabbed Thunder Rosa at one point like she was going to snap mare, but then as Thunder Rosa tried to take the mare... <laughs> Marina just walked to the middle of the ring with her, with her arm, head in the, I, I don't know. Jim Ross said, well, this is possibly a clash of styles here. I've seen smoother shoots. And she, she almost killed Rosa with a snap suplex. We've not seen Marina wrestle, but maybe once, or was she in a, multiple person match or whatever but they went to a break in the middle of this didn't we see god we saw her in jade i think didn't we you know what this was i don't know but it was another match that was abysmal it was her and jade hurt to fans feelings that's what it was and they came back from the break which i was paying closer attention to the commercials because i knew it was going to come back to this but when they came back, Rosa was apparently in mid comeback, but it wouldn't end. And I wrote poor Thunder Rosa. And finally, she won with a roll up one, two, three. And then <laughs> Marina attacked her and got some heat afterwards. And Tony Storm hit the ring and made the save. And they both beat Marina up. So they beat the heel. They have her jump on the baby face afterwards to get some heat back, and then they have another baby face come down, and the two baby faces beat the shit out of the one heel again. What? And it's not like this doesn't happen often these days. Again, at one point, if you'd have pitched that finish to the heel, the heel would have said, well, I tell you what, since you've just beat me, I'm going to go on my merry way and leave the ring while I've still got a career because now you want to beat me. Then you want me to get back on the fucking guy that just beat me. And then you want two of them to beat me up again and run me off. Why don't you piss in my mouth while I'm down there? But now Mark Booker's and inexperienced wrestlers put this shit together just so everybody gets a chance to do some of their shit. And then the main event, and I just remembered something. The main event was Kyle O'Reilly and John Moxley with the winner going on to face the winner of the cat that chased the rat that lived in the house that Tony built. And I said at the start of this, I like Kyle O'Reilly, but can anybody have a match with Moxley where it doesn't suck and it'll be any different and it won't be the garbage match and the fighting on the floor and the drinking of the blood? And then I just now remembered as I'm looking at my notes, <laughs> I stopped this because I needed to go take a piss. And then I went downstairs and took Harley out to piss. And then I got started talking. I forgot to watch the match. <laughs> what happened? Moxley won. And he is going on to face the winner of another match for the opportunity to be the interim champion. Did I miss anything? Nothing that you would have enjoyed because. You don't like Moxie. O'Reilly looked great. O'Reilly's been looking great. They got to do something better with him. Well, we don't have to worry about that sooner or later because within the next few weeks, it'll be a lost cause anyway. The bloom will be so far off the rose that O'Reilly will be pigeonholed as to where he's been, which is a guy that loses most of the time and hangs out in a group. Because the way that you introduce people It's generally the way that people remember them. Except when you scream all their names at the same time and nobody knows who anybody is to begin with. Then you don't remember them at all. I'm sorry, I'll try to remember to watch the main event next week, but God almighty. Well, you watched the main event on Rampage, right? Oh, I forgot about that. We got one more thing to talk about. Because on Rampage, where are my notes? Hold on here. We got the opportunity to see the world's greatest wrestler, part two, Will Ospreay. And by the way, on Rampage, I don't know if you, I know you tried to zip through some of this, but they've just given up now that this is even a professional television program. The thing comes on the air and Eddie Kingston and Jake Hager are already in the ring and the match is already going. 
They don't even bother with introductions, intros, billboard, whatever. And then we also got to see the all-star team of Jay Lethal and Satnam Singe against Davey Vega and Matt Fitchett. And I will say one thing. The jobbers looked horrible. They had the stench of grisly death upon them. But Singe is already better than almost. Did you watch any of this? I did. I was surprised that they had this guy who we've not seen wrestle yet have his debut on Rampage without any announcement that I heard. Oh, yeah. Well, it's not meant to be important in any way that the largest man in the history of the world has his first match on television. That's why they threw it away on the direct show. But he can walk all the way across the ring without tripping. He looks like he knows his left from his right. He grabbed people and did things to them that actually weren't embarrassing. And he hit a double cross body on when the both of the mooches tried to fucking clothesline him. He just ran through him, came off the other side and hit him with a double cross body and flattened him. And then picked him up and held him for the double lethal injection. One, two, three. And then, of course, they got more heat on it. But Satnam Singe has already submerged past almost as the better of the two giants. So this will be interesting. And then the Red Velvet wrestled Chris Statlander. And apparently, Chris Statlander is no longer an alien from the Andromeda Galaxy. She had a new look, new gear. She was announced from Long Island, New York. And I said, okay, I'm going to watch this then. And I'm going to see, now that she's straightened up and rejoined the human race, people have said she's getting better. She had potential when we first saw her. She just kept putting everybody in the hospital. So I'll watch this match, right? Stadlander makes her entrance and gets to the ring on the floor, and here comes Red Velvet and charges at her. And Statlander gave her a perfect, perfect Buzz Sawyer turnaround power slam on the fucking floor. Looked like a million dollars. Grabbed her, picked her up, tossed her in the ring, (laughs) and they rang the bell and started the match. A hundred pound girl just got Buzz Sawyer power slammed on the floor within... The first 30 seconds, she was up, walking around, running the ropes. What I'll watch the next Chris Statlander match. Hey, to our earlier discussion about the best friends, what does that tell you also? She's no longer an alien, and she's no longer... It doesn't appear she's a part of the best friends any longer. One can hope. Once again, will they give the people what they want, which is the best friends to be buried in a landfill? All right. The reason why I'm even watching this jobber extravaganza is because old Will Osprey's going to wrestle FTR and Trent, for whatever reason that they're a team, against Ostrich and... Okay, now there there was an Aaron Hanori involved, but Mark Davis and Kyle Fletcher are the team of Aussie Open, right? I believe so. And uh, Hanori is, um... I don't, is he, is that, he related to, oh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, well, I was thinking of Masa Hattori rather than Aaron Hanori. I was wondering if he was related to him. I was thinking of Masa Hori. Hello, Masa. How are you? Hello, Masa. I bet, greatest fan in the world. So they did the interview with Mark Henry where Mark Henry can say his catchphrase. And did you see, what was Will Osprey wearing? It looked like a, a furry ring jacket that was like a, a, Bruiser Brody meets Sergeant Pepper. I there love- were colored bangles with furry. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck. I thought it was great. He looks so different. I Different than what? I've never seen him before. He looks like, remember the movie Hook? Where Peter Pan goes back and he finds the Lost Boys. <laughs> he looks like one of the Lost Boys grown up and he's got like this <laughs> makeshift fucking robe that he put together. With like <laughs> fur and, and bedazzled and... <laughs> Well, anyway, um, (laughs) Dax's comment in the promo was, you guys are used to playing wrestling. They love to get these guys, because it's true, right? And I bet they can get under their skin with it. I still don't know why Trent is with FDR, or FDR, FTR. I wrote down here just an idle note, when did Randy Mulkey team with the Horsemen? Never, I don't remember that. Oh, let's be fair. You can't compare Trent to Randy Mulkey. 
No, Randy took great bumps. Oh, come on. You see, that's ridiculous. But anyway, I mentioned that earlier in the program, the first time I saw old Will Ostrich, he was skinny and they did the gymnastic routine and it was just a laugh fest. Well, now this guy, he's apparently put on size. I don't recall him yeah. being that that thick. He's he's bigger. He's in shape. He's athletic. He looks good. He seems serious. The promo, he's not the best wrestler in the world because if you don't have the promo, you can't be the best in the world. And I heard his promo. And there's there's nothing that anybody's going to say to make me think that he's a great promo. However, I was watching, okay, when they started out, like I said, athletic, looked good, he was being serious, but then they got into the fancy shit, him and Cash doing a spot where he's going to duck and leap up and flying Hurricane Ron or whatever, and he fell on his ass. And it looked like Cash went to, to do it the first time, and he just ran right by Cash. So Cash turns around and goes to catch him the second time, and fucking Osprey went over top. He said, I don't know what the fuck they were doing. Fletcher and Davis looked like they work for a roofing company. Just two guys in fucking tights that they bought at the Halloween store. So after the botched spot, Osprey got in one more time, didn't really do anything, then they went to the break. Come back from the break, Osprey is in the middle of taking a high backdrop, and that looked fabulous. And then he basically got in and fed for Dax's comeback and took two bumps and then disappeared. And then two minutes later, he came back and took one bump for Cash. Then the, the tag team guys hit Cash with five team moves, double team moves, over and over, not giving him a chance to bump or sell or fall or whatever, like they do in Japan and on the indies, which makes no sense. It just makes yourself look weak and meaningless. And then Osprey hit the 450 splash off the top rope. But then Trent made the save, and then everybody hit moves on everybody. So this idiot tag team just hit like three or four double, legitimately three or four double team moves in quick succession on the guy. And then Osprey hits his 450 splash, and that's a false finish. And then everybody gets up and just does stuff, including the guy that just fucking got decimated with 18 moves and then finally FTR and Trent win guess how Randy Mulkey got the pin FTR's in the ring but yet Trent is the one who wins the fucking match with a pin over Hanoi Jane or whatever their name was it, Will Osprey didn't do anything offensive he doesn't gesticulate and finger point like twinkle toes uncle dave's other favorite great greatest wrestler in the world he doesn't hit the ropes like tinkerbell he doesn't make faces like his butt plug just fell out he's in shape he looks athletic but he did in this match next to nothing he botched one spot took a backdrop got in took a couple other bumps and that was all I saw of him. So I still don't know how far away from being the greatest wrestler in the world he is. I just know he's not. Sounds like he's smart. Sounds like he realized we're losing. I'm going to do as little as I can <laughs> to be seen in this match. But wouldn't you think if nobody in a, an entire country of 350 million people and nobody's ever fucking seen you and you get the opportunity to be on national television, even if your team is losing, wouldn't you think you would try to figure out a way to make some kind of impression? Uh, yes, unless I was in the main event on the Rampage at 10.45 at night. Well, but that's still more television than he's ever been on in this country in his life. That's true. I didn't mind the tag team as much as you did. It just, it, it just looked like two more interchangeable generic indie guys that don't really have a look, and they do the same moves everybody else does. I wasn't... It's, you know, it, it, you can, when FTR gets in the ring, Dax or Cash, either one, you can tell from the time they lock up, you can tell when they hit the ropes, you can tell how they circle each other before they lock up. You can tell, take my arm the way he gets the arm. You can tell with those guys, they're impeccable. The other guys are just indie guys that do moves. 
But that's so I'm going to watch Osprey again if he ever shows up again because I want to see what all the what's causing all this. But there was nothing to really watch there. I mean, I'm not. Now I already like him much better than Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang. It's, I'm not knocking him. I just didn't see anything to make me impressed because there wasn't anything there that was impressive. Maybe we'll see him again. You're basically saying what it is. You can't really judge him off anything in this match other than look. And that's, you know, a lot, again, with the, I can understand the, the writers in the WWE never been in the ring, never trained, never been athletic of any kind, never been in a fight. They don't know how to match guys up to accentuate their strengths and negate their weaknesses. They just put, people in the ring here have this guy wrestle this guy and they don't think of what it's going to look like with tony khan and the indie bookers it's even worse because they know kind of what it's going to look like and they think that's a good idea they go oh, we'll put this guy and that guy in the ring against each other they have completely different styles they do nothing the same and the one guy's from mexico and the other guy's from fucking world of sport in england whatever the fuck but that'll be a dream match because they'll be doing different styles at the same time. And to the basement dwelling fucking ADD addicted marks that dream up dream matches constantly, that's a big deal. But in actual fact and practice, you don't want guys to have style clashes. That's why Jim Ross calls them style clashes when somebody's having a bad match. Because that's what you have when you have a Styles Clash, is a bad match. Because your shit doesn't work smoothly with their shit and vice versa. But so the comedy writers in the WWE, they put those together because they don't know any better. The people in AEW led by Tony Khan actually do it on purpose because they think that it will be enjoyable. And if you're watching to see something fall in a fucking toilet, it's enjoyable. But if you're trying to watch and see a good wrestling match or one of the other people involved in it get over and nobody get dropped on their head or botch embarrassingly, then it's not a good idea. But that's just me. Well, that was the week in wrestling. Closing thoughts, Brian. Closing thoughts. We'll see you on the drive through <laughs> Your sinuses are bothering you again, aren't they? All right, thank you, everybody. We'll we'll try to make it better next week on the drive through if they'll give us anything to work with. And if not, we'll try to come up with some classic talk. Just keep people occupied because this was this was a a bad few days for the wrestling industry. Maybe we should just find the time machine and put ourselves nine months ahead. Punk will be back and settled in. Cody will be back. MJF will be the biggest star in the WWF by then. It'd be, it, we've got something to look forward to at least. It's just the next few months, it sounds like, are going to be like trying to crawl across hell with gasoline britches on. All right, well, we can look forward to the drive through this coming week. Yeah, I believe you mentioned that. All righty then, in that case, now this time you got to piss. Well, I'll tell you, I'll just, did I ever tell you about the time? No, I'm going to close up so Brian can go to the bathroom. Folks, we'll see you on the drive through next week on The Experience. Visit jimcornett.com if you get a chance. Uh, watch the, or listen to, or do all those things, the 605 Super Podcast. Shut up and wrestle. Shut up and bake. I'm about to cut you off if you don't stop right now. Stick to goddamn wrestling. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.